All right, welcome everybody to the House Committee on Government Operations and Military Affairs. It's Tuesday, April 25th, and uh, we're here this afternoon picking up our work on S-17. And so at Legislative Council here, so Tim, uh, would you take us through um, some of the changes? I believe we're looking at uh, draft 2.2. I'd be happy to. Thank you very much for having me, <clears throat> Chair McCarthy. Again, for the record, my name is Tim Devlin, Legislative Council. Before you, you will have draft 2.2, which is a committee um, strike all amendment to the Senate Bill number 17, an act relating to sheriff's reforms. The differences between the last iteration of this strike all amendment uh, that the committee reviewed and this one have been highlighted uh, just for ease of reference. The first update proposed is on page two, and this is under section two, uh, under the bill per part pertaining to audits. And <clears throat> the highlighted text here is um, substantively the same as what was last proposed, um, but this now breaks up the previously proposed language uh, for the sake of readability and clarity for the most part. Uh, but the substance of it should look um, for the most part, very much the same. Um, happy to read through this as it now presents, uh, Chair McCarthy, if you'd like, or would you like me to just kind of continue on? Um, yeah, so why don't we just take a, a quick look through here. So we're, we're basically separating the um, signing, co-signing requirements from the having a written transition plan for clarity, right? Yes, yeah, it was um, one kind of continuous sentence before, and we've just kind of broken that up. So, um, <clears throat> and perhaps I'll just uh, read sure. it. Sure. Okay. Um, subsection D, new subdivision one, will read Upon the election of a sheriff elect who is not the incumbent sheriff, an announcement that the incumbent sheriff will not seek re election. Or an announcement that the incumbent sheriff intends to resign, whichever occurs first, all financial disbursements from the accounts of the department, including the transfer of real or personal property or other assets of the department, shall be co-signed by the sheriff and the assistant judge. The sheriff shall provide a written transition plan to the assistant judge detailing all anticipated disbursements or transfers of departmental assets. Assistant judges shall consult with the department's staff and sheriff's executive committee prior to co-signing any disbursements or transfer of sheriff's department assets. In subdivision two, an assistant judge shall forward the sheriff's written transition plan and a report of all financial disbursements and transfers made pursuant to the subsection to the auditor of accounts within 15 days of the following <clears throat> Sorry, 15 days following the sheriff leaving office. I'll pause there. Representative Hickley. Thank you. Um, the only question I've got, I guess, is there was a concern around, you know, a, a sheriff that was elected and from the period of time that they were elected to the period of time that they took office. This section really doesn't include any of that concern around what the existing elected sheriff can do in that interim time. And I'm wondering if, if where that might be addressed or if it should be addressed. I think, you know, Senator Norris talked about it in particular, as far as from the time that he was elected, the time that he took office. There's a period of time there that is. So this may not, we may not have totally addressed it, but what it's trying to do is at least provide the, so from the time that even before there's the new, the, the, so starting from the time when the sitting sheriff says, I'm not running, that the earliest time, so we bring that time way up, that there's more transparency. So they have to have a transition plan. There's this co-signing with the um, side judges. The Sheriff's Association had asked us to do, to add this in consultation with the Sheriff's Executive Committee and the department so that a side judge who may not be able to really evaluate those things would, would have that, that check. Um, but I guess that I throw it back and say, um, is there a, an additional layer of accountability or clarity that, that you wanna have beyond what's envisioned here with the kind of co-signing 
once we know a sheriff's going to be transitioning out. Well, again, I don't want to complicate things, but I guess it'd be good to hear from you know the sheriffs in particular. Yeah, because this is an attempt to kind of massage the language that the Senate had, so and then that the Department of the State's Attorneys and Sheriffs have recommended. Uh, building on that a little bit. And so now I'm wondering if we've gone too far with the Frankensteining mm -hmm. by trying to satisfy everyone's concerns where it's not not clear enough. <laughs> Representative Morgan. Yeah, just real quick. So it's sort of on that vein of thought. Um, is number two, a, I, I'll just be blunt, is it sort of an addressing of what uh, occurred at the end of the tenure of the, the last tenure of the Caledonia? Sheriff's Department, am I misreading into this? In other words, if they were going to do an exit disbursement like was done, we found it was all completely legal and above board, obviously. But um, is that an attempt to address some of that? Is that what we're trying to do here? Because we're using under number two, we say of all financial disbursements and transfers, of, that was that the intent? Yeah, I think what we're just trying to do is whether it's that situation or the kind of situation that uh, Sheriff, uh, former Sheriff Senator Norris talked about, he'll always be Sheriff Mars to me. Oh, yeah, uh, sure. When I was growing up, you know, that was his title. <laughs> um, <laughs> so what he was saying was, you know, he showed up at an office that all the assets had been spent down and right. some cars had been right. sold. And, you know, was, yeah. so we're trying to basically be like, OK, when when we know that a, a sheriff is exiting, there needs to be this increased layer of checks and balances. Disclosure. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. That's what I'm just asking. Yeah, I just want to see if that was part of that intent. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. And um, uh, represent people. But is there anything there to protect the other side of the equation where the judge basically says, I'm not going to do anything until the new sheriff comes? So, yeah, so what we were trying to do here by having the consultation with the sheriff's executive committee in the department is that is to add that a little bit more. Um, so there's sort of the like the watcher of the watcher problem here that we have where we're expanding out the checks and balances. But I'm wondering, um, I don't want to hold Tim too long. I do want to get through this, but I believe potentially Sheriff Eric Anderson may be able to help us out here. <laughs> uh, for the record, Mark Anderson, Linden County Sheriff of the President of Sheriff's Association. Uh, I believe our testimony, and we might not have, I might not have communicated it clearly, but was to say the uh, executive committee could be like a, an appeal authority. So let's say that we run into the situation that Representative Hooper saying, the assistant judge says, I'm just not gonna sign it. They can be an appeal saying, this is an authorized exposure about an expense. Um, you don't need snowmobiles to operate your sheriff's department. You do need cars. So if an uh, assistant judge says they don't feel comfortable uh, responding to uh, a sheriff's request to sell the snowmobiles, the association, or I'm sorry, the executive committee would be able to reflect that um, like this is an appropriate expense. And they're generally the ones who are going to be remaining and dealing with any issues if they were to happen again if this legislation failed to satisfy all the possible. <laughs> okay. I, I hear that, but I don't read that. That's, we did not capture, we did not go as far as the Sheriff's Association recommended. So let's put a pin in that for now and we'll come back to this section because I don't, okay. I'm hearing from the committee we haven't quite nailed it yet. No, I agree. The next part of this that has changed can be found, let's see, on page six. And we'll transition now to the part of the <clears throat> strike all amendment um, pertaining to Sheriff's Department compensation and benefits. This is in section five. Um, the subsection C, you can see the, that last um, highlighted uh, two sentences there. Um, really, this pertains again to that 5% um, we've been talking about at length. Uh, this has been rewritten to clarify that funds derived from charges for administration of the contract may be used for any purpose, but if they used for compensation related uh, items, then they must follow a, uh, the model policy that's to be uh, uh, drafted by uh, DSAS. Also, just want to quickly note that second sentence was moved up, um, but what did exist in the prior uh, proposed reference to, uh, that's the Category B conduct right there that will, will failure to comply with this policy shall constitute category B conduct pursuant to 20 VSA 2401 subsection 2. 
the next part of the bill that is changed, we'll see in top of page eight. This is under section B5, <clears throat> um, Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. And this removes the provision for the deputy that uh, proposed new position here, the deputy, um, to create the model policy. Instead, the deputy director of sheriff shall instead assist each sheriff's department in maintaining compliance with the sheriff's department's compensation and benefits model policy. The next change will appear at the bottom of page nine, breaking into page 10. And this pertains to sheriff's duties. In particular, um, the, um, sorry, this will essentially add back an affirmative duty for sheriffs to provide assistance um, for domestic violence survivors um, to retrieve their personal belongings from that individual's residence and also will prohibit a sheriff's department from seeking a fee for competition providing that service. So Tim, what, what I had asked after getting some feedback from the network and others was that we, what we don't want to do uh, is say that sheriffs are the exclusive providers of this standby service. Because then we're basically saying that all the law enforcement agencies across the state that aren't sheriffs who do this work, well, they're done. <laughs> you call the sheriff if you need standby service. And that just isn't practical unless we're going to, you know, have a completely different uh, way that we're approaching this. So uh, what we're trying to get at here is that we shouldn't be charging the survivors for this service, but that we don't want to put all of the provision of this service exclusively on the sheriffs. And so trying to thread that needle here. Uh, and I should oh, go ahead. Yeah. So I should just add the nuance that this um, uh, shall kind of duty here is really uh, triggered by a request for such service. That's an important piece that wasn't there before. I just want to mention that. And, and we will take some testimony on this piece again, trying to satisfy multiple different stakeholders feedback over the weekend. And we may not have landed in a perfect spot yet. And the last update we find on page 10 as well, section 7A, Sheriff's Deputy Provision of Courthouse Sec Security, semicolon report. And essentially what this does is um, now we'll have the judiciary um, to be reporting uh, the provision of law enforcement and security services to county and state courthouses before it was the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. And that is some, uh, that um, is all the updates from the last version. Tim, I am sure after our testimony this afternoon, we will probably have some more work for you, but I will relinquish you uh, to Senate GovOps for now. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, so I would like to invite uh, Terry to come up. Uh, if you want to come up as a team, pause. <laughs> I think if that's okay. Uh... <laughs> Uh, Terry Corson, State Court Administrator, and Greg Mersley, who's Chief of Finance and Administration, definitely has much, a much better grasp on budget details. So we thought it'd be uh, efficient to have him join us. Well, welcome to both of you. And um, I specifically asked uh, for your office's um, feedback on how to approach the uh, request that we had heard around how do we provide consistent courthouse security. Um, and so we've looked at this issue a couple of times in the context of reviewing the budget requests. And now um, this, the idea that potentially we can move toward um, having all of the uh, courthouse security provided by deputies who are similarly state employees uh, as is done with the transport deputies has been put on the table by several folks. Um, and so I wanted to get feedback on that particular issue from the courts. Well, we really appreciate the opportunity and also all the time and effort that you've dedicated to court security considerations. We're so appreciative. 
And I guess in terms of the most recent version of S-17, which we have a, had a chance to look at um, today, uh, there are three sections that pertain to the judiciary, in, in particular in courthouse security. Uh, the first in section five talks about the, the single contractual rate of pay, which we support and we appreciate that being inserted. The second has to do with providing a minimum of one sheriff deputy per courthouse. There are 23 state and uh, county courthouses throughout the state with an effective date of July 1, 2024, in recognition of the workforce challenges that the sheriff's offices have in terms of meeting that a minimum by July 1 of this year. <clears throat> and then the new provision, Section 7A, that has to do with this report that we think is as a, a phenomenal opportunity to be able to really study and analyze what would be the best uh, approach in terms of I think I'd explained last time, historically, it was always sheriff's deputies that provided all the courthouse security. Now it's a combination of different factors. And in light of those workforce challenges, figuring out what's the best way to ensure that we can meet our and fulfill our responsibility to maintain courthouse security um, in Vermont. Um, so we really appreciate the report and being able to do it in consultation with the uh, Department of State's attorneys and sheriffs, and, and certainly also with other relevant stakeholders, such as court staff, personnel, and others, to make sure we have as full a, a picture as possible. We would um, ask, uh, there's been one other change um, with it that talks about at the end, um, creation of classified positions responsible for courthouse security services similar to the classified position transport deputy. And that um, it well may be that state paid deputies would be the model that would work the best and should be fit, should fit into whatever the report's recommendations are. But we thought with the language, it almost asked, um, is concluding that that's the case. So we didn't know instead of saying similar to, you might say such as the classified position of transport deputy. And uh, we've also talked about with Sheriff Anderson and also um, with Vince Aluzzi and Steve Howard just before coming in here, how a model of state paid deputies may well work. Uh, but Greg has, based on his experience with the budget, um, uh, I, I guess a, a recommendation in terms of how that possibly might work uh, so that we can maintain proper control over the budget, over the actual security and scheduling, et cetera. So um, right now we have uh, about 73 FDPs that provide court security. That's a, a mix of, of sheriff deputies, about 40 of them, along with 10 security, private security guards. Then we have about 23 employees. Um, there's 23 different courthouses. They're all very, very different. So it's a, a little bit of a patch together um, idea. And we clearly understand and want law enforcement under the courthouse roof all the time. That is, that is something that's important to us. We have a few situations where that's not the case and there are issues and shots. Um, so it is definitely ideal for us to have a law enforcement officer in each courthouse when it's open. Um, in terms of uh, the, the study and models, um, there are a lot of different models that can be used. We, we have access to the National Center for State Courts that uh, has best practices. Um, for court security, and we also have relationships with our other judiciary partners in the other 50 states that all have some sort of model put together. And we can certainly do a lot of research and pull together the pros and cons of some of those different models. Um, the one thing that we would have heard about, is, as Terry mentioned, is um, a language that kind of suggests a solution before the study actually gets going, like a position of some kind. Or, or that um, particular model is the way that we're looking at. So we're, we're open to changing up the structure because it has been a management effort um, for many years. Uh, so we see it headed in the right direction and we look forward to working with a number of partners to, to put the, our best thoughts on it. One idea um, would be if there were state paid deputy model though, that it be under the purview of the judiciary and our ability to budget, to control the budget and the supervision and the scheduling. So that would mean having it versus under the purview of the Department of Sheriffs and State's Attorneys, that it be uh, basically uh, within uh, the judiciary, state paid deputies, for example, could be the model certainly, but, but with that ability to control so as to best ensure that we meet our, able to meet our constitutional and statutory responsibilities in terms of ensuring courthouse security. 
Um, the other thing that just came up was the possibility with section uh, seven, which talks about one minimum deputy by July 1, 2024, whether or not that again kind of um, uh, suggests would a suggest a solution, whether or not the report should instead state what would be the deadline and what would be the minimum. Um, so we didn't know if it was maybe a good idea to mold the two for that reason. It just seemed that it might make sense rather than saying you shall by this date when it may be that the report suggests a different date or a different minimum that that was something that just came up that we wanted to mention. Uh, so I have a couple of hands that have come up uh, with questions. Uh, if you know, if we can dive into that now, so Representative Morgan, and then I'll go to you, Representative. Yep. Thank you. Um, so in this territory, I really want to. Um, I, I believe I can read into this to say that your this report when we get it December first um, would have the one off of the student center is like you remember with Grand Isle County Terry severe staffing shortages so we would have an uh, an off ramp I assume am I making a correct assumption off ramp for a situation like that because they may just plain not have the manpower that would. I would hope that would be a component of it, yes. That would right be good example. And certainly the judiciary making efforts to ensure that there's courthouse security in whatever form is right. feasible. That's what I'm getting. Like in this case, I believe, unless something changed great now, still at the moment has, unless Sheriff Allen has to have, has to have to it, I think still has a, a, a contracted individual there. You're so right. we've, we've evolved since that crisis. And for a while, we had our own employee who um, is a level two certified. Yeah. Um, who's in that courthouse for a number of months before we were able to arrange for the private security guard. Yeah. Now it's supplemented by out-of-county state bill deputies sometimes on okay. the days. Okay. So it's it's a great example of the flexibility that we have today to uh, try and address the needs of each court so that we can get the hearings and trials moving. And you would envision that continuing further or forward because, again, you can't have the crystal ball of what every county is going to look like forevermore. We, we don't, right? I mean, okay. Just want to make sure that, I guess, relative assurance was there that that is an option because in a moment's time, you could lose half your staff for whatever reason, we don't know. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, when you were doing a rundown of positions, you said you had 40 that were deputies. Yes. 10 that were private. Yes. 23 that were something else. Is that where the court officers, do they fall into that or what? They can. Um, they're 23 state uh, full-time employees. And so they have, uh, they're either court officers or court screeners. So they can be at the front door screening. Uh, most often they're court officers in the court. And they are not sworn in any way, no level. They're, they're not going to train them to do the work that's provided. Um, uh, but you know, like I said, we, we do need a law enforcement officer under that roof because when there's an incident, when yeah. the judge says take this person into custody or when somebody comes in to surrender because of an arrest warrant, we'll struggle if we don't have a law enforcement officer. And Terry, were you sort of advocating for a Sheriff's Department within the judiciary? Not a sheriff's department. Well, it, it, <coughs> but the state somebody that supervises the actual deputies. Yeah. It, right. Uh, uh, advocating is not the right word. Uh, it's <laughs> a number of our fellow states have judicial marshal services where they have law enforcement that are under the direction of the judiciary. Um, in this state, the state paid deputy transport model is kind of that same model. Um, so it's one of the many options that, that I think are out there. We're certainly open to exploring and understanding the need, to, you know. Yeah, that's it's just that seems yeah. to be another hole. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm just getting noise from the door. I appreciate Tom jumping up there. So uh, just to follow on to what Rep Hooper asked of team folks. So the, the court officer. Again, I've been the grand out. I keep using that's the one I is my example. Um, that so does each court have as he was talking about the 23 and there's 23 courthouses. You said that court officer in there, or do in some cases they rely on that person's also 
could double as the door guard that would have to run upstairs, potentially like in the case of Grand Isles Courthouse, if there was a problem and go, I got it, I'm, you know, I'm the guy in charge or the guy in charge of taking care of that situation. Is that, that what I'm hearing? Because they're, like I know Grand Isles, I believe there's a gentleman sits in the, the court when they're there. Every courthouse does have a screener. And that's the first line of defense sure. because they check for weapons. At the, at the front door, essentially. Right. Yes. And then otherwise, if there are hearings yes. in the courthouse, certainly criminal and family hearings, yes. there would be a court a officer presence in the courtroom, whether it's a sheriff deputy, whether it's, uh, I guess you would know. Yeah, that. well, for instance, an example of Grand Isle, oftentimes it's a state paid from out of county. Right, that's the gentleman so, I'm familiar with. Um, yeah. The court officer may or may not be a law enforcement, may or may not. So in Grand Isle, I would imagine they generally have hearings on Thursdays. Um, there are times when there are hearings and there might be one officer there or there might be two, but neither one of them are law enforcement. Certainly in other counties, in our smaller courthouses, there are hearing days where there's one person at the front door. And if there's a problem in the court, they would have to run up. They have to lock over. the front door and then run up. Gotcha. The okay. National best practices have recommended two offices. Yeah. Oh, I can see that. That's why I'm kind of getting at is, is there any inherent danger with that not being present? We had a, a study done. had an issue. Yeah. We had the National Center do a study in 2015. So it's dated. And uh, their recommendation was to add 35 positions to court security across the state, which we've never done. We've added one since then. Yeah. So, uh, the question is, do we really need what they're recommending? Um, so, for example, they're recommending three officers at the screening front door. One to manage the crowd, one to manage the equipment, and one to be there in case of an emergency. In Vermont, especially in our smaller courthouses, that does seem to be a bit of overkill. Yeah, and I can understand that. It's just the fine line of if you had a problem, you want that to make sure that there's a timely response, I guess, yeah. what I would be concerned about. Exactly. Yeah. So as long as we're balancing that, and I, and I get it, it's one of those things you, we don't have a gazillion people for these positions to do this stuff. And so, I, okay, thank you. So, following up on what Morgan said, 23 courthouses, 23 possible court officers, small courthouse example. I had spent most of my time in Costello where it would be the norm to have three or more people at the door, plus three active courtrooms, probably minimum with court officers in each one. The math seems to indicate somebody's coming up short on that. We have nine courtrooms in Costello. Yeah. Okay. All, and on certain days, sometimes they're all in Yeah, okay. Yeah, and, and, and that model, we have one law enforcement officer in the building, it's a rover, so while he spends most of his time at the front door, mm -hmm. he can walk around the building wherever he is. So there should be two other screeners at that front door. That's one of the more challenging, but there's other tenants in that building as well. And they have security needs that honestly are not addressed by court security. The security that we contract with with sheriffs is designed for courthouse. And so when we close at 4.30, sheriff's deputies go away. That's the end of the day. So probation for all has a six o'clock group meeting in a courthouse. There's no security. Well, BGS would be responsible for BGS would be security. responsible for executive branch security. Mm -hmm. It's and every building is a little bit different and unique, and so it creates a lot of different unique problems. Everything from the evening or weekend, you know, yeah. state attorney wants a weekend um, uh, you know, traffic day uh, that they've done and traffic um, holidays, whatever. Um, that that can create problems. We've also had situations where DCF case managers will try and have meetings that they know are going to be uh, volatile down near the, the security in a courtroom space. And if those run past 430, we've paid the overtime bill for the sheriff because of the DCF meetings. So all sorts of weird things happen. Uh, and it's just something that we've managed. It requires you folks to be good jugglers. Yeah. And, and another another example of, of oddities with executive branch sharing is we have court security cameras. And when something happens in the DCF hallway and they want access to the video, they actually have to subpoena us and ask for it. We, we don't share the management of that or the maintenance and the cost of replacement parts. 
It's a judicial system. In Addison County, uh, the sheriff had a camera at the front door. The judiciary has cameras throughout the court area. I think DDP had a camera there for a little while. There were three different cameras in the lobby of, of Addison. Um, again, the, 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 just a, that's a little bit of government bureaucracy, but it has. So my question is kind of similarly related to that, and I think you, you got at it some point in the memo that you had provided us that talked about the, the different, so I just wanted to be really clear with the committee. So right now, as it stands today, before this language in S17, there's kind of a spectrum of people providing security at the courthouses. And if I'm understanding your testimony correctly, the court officers who are judiciary employees most of them are not law enforcement officers or they're not. Um, then the, there are per diem and sheriff's deputies who are assigned contracted. And then there's private security. So there's this whole spectrum. I'm wondering how much control you all have through your contracts uh, on in terms of the schedule of the deputies who are assigned to you from the sheriff's offices. And if they, when there are those contracts in place with the current labor market being what it is, are, are those folks satisfying the, the hours, the schedule that the judiciary really needs right now, or is there still a pretty big gap? I would say there's a bit of a gap because our staffing 73 FTEs in total um, are minimally necessary. So when you get a couple of people calling out or somebody on medical leave, it creates a problem. And so the contracted deputies, the 40 FTEs that are sheriff deputies, generally are full-time positions. We need them at the screening door or the court, court, um, courtroom all the time. Um, where it gets a little more flexible is with private security. We have called them on short notice and said, can you move your trained guy from this court to that court? And sometimes they can help us. Where it really gets to be flexible is in our employees. We have um, seven employees who are hired to be a statewide resource, and we will call them at six in the morning and say, got a call out up here at this court, they have a trial going on. You know, you were scheduled in court A, you're going to go to court B, please get there by 8 30, and we'll pay for time traveling for them to get there. So, you know, because we have those different groups of employees or our security, we're able to use them differently. We need the, the four deputies in the courthouse all the time. And then when there's a trial, we might want to slide a couple of employees from Addison or Bennington over to Rutland to make sure that trial goes okay. Um, that kind of flexibility happens on a daily basis. We, we are moving and matching every single day. Other questions for Terry and Craig? That was very helpful. Thank you both for being with us today. I imagine you might like to stick around and hear some of the subsequent testimony on this issue. <laughs> We'd appreciate that very, right. very much. And Thank you. I see that uh, Judge Zone is is on Zoom. I don't know if he would like to testify or just here and listen in. Uh, <laughs> right over I wanted to show. offer him the opportunity. Oh, I didn't think we would have you with us today. Judge Zone is ignore <laughs> no no it, it's my pleasure for the record tom zoni chief superior judge i don't have anything to add in addition to what uh, terry and greg have presented but certainly if there's any questions i'd be happy to address them great well thank you for being here and listening in and i uh, really appreciate the the dialogue here I'm trying to sort of get this right at least head in that direction for the future with this report so thank you great um, so our next person scheduled to testify on this is uh, Sheriff Anderson. So if you guys want to switch seats here. Thanks for being with us again. Oh, thank you for the opportunity. For the record, Mark Anderson, Sheriff of Wyndham County and President of the Vermont Sheriff's Association. Uh, I'm here in the capacity as President of the Sheriff's Association. Um, so I think um, I was hoping that uh, you could weigh in on both the, the language that's in draft 2.2 in, in regard to the um, courthouses and gen more generally looking forward um, 
you know, where you see the sheriffs fitting into the provision of courthouse security. Uh, and I think we will have time uh, once we get through these sections to have you back if you want to talk about other parts of the bill as well today. Great, thank you. Uh, so bottom line up front, uh, we're good with the study. <laughs> Uh, so let's not it's a report it's not a study uh, <laughs> I consider all the same uh, so yeah, thank you for they're not all the same in here yeah, right? yeah. thank you for yeah. uh, so we we support the report um, we didn't come to the table uh, at the beginning of the session uh, with any expectation or anticipation that this was going to be part of the discussion this wasn't our ask we're not opposed to the ask, it's just it wasn't our ask. Uh, and so uh, in working with the, the judiciary, who's been great partners, uh, we recognize the desire, uh, the need. Uh, and so I, I'd like to speak at least briefly uh, about what is court security to the sheriffs, uh, as well as um, our law enforcement capacity, because I don't think that's necessarily been covered too much. Court security, uh, or really security in general, we're talking about um, access control. We're talking about uh, staff protection, whether it's the court staff or it's the judge themselves. Uh, and historically, sheriffs in Vermont have provided that uh, that service. The uh, You heard uh, Mr. Uh, Mosley say, uh, that they were up, the judiciary has been underfunded the 35 positions from the recommendation. And we've seen that uh, in Wyndham County, we have uh, the new fame courthouse, which has the one person at the door and they're also the court officer and chief ninja, uh, everything else. Uh, whereas at the Padua courthouse, we have, I think it's four to five positions that have to deal with two courtrooms running. And well, if someone calls in sick, then where do you pull? Uh, so, the um, with court security uh, dealing with uh, that physical access controls one piece. Their screener, their monitoring uh, equipment, property coming in. Uh, they're making sure that uh, staff are secure. They're making sure doors are secure, uh, and that broad context. There's cameras that are monitored in most courthouses, if not all, uh, and that's security. Deputy sheriffs currently provide that function, but security is different than law enforcement. And so I believe it was about seven years ago, it was the Chittenden Courthouse, there was a, a sexual assault reported uh, at the courthouse. Law enforcement investigates that, and as to whether that would be the courts, uh, law enforcement uh, deputies, or that is, say, in, in that case, the Burlington Police Department, certainly uh, there's resources to bring in for major crimes. But there are also crimes that our deputies would investigate within the courthouse. And uh, to a degree, there's a, a concept where the judiciary is going to want to be impartial to the investigation because they're going to be the same court that is going to be having the hearing when it comes before them. So in our minds, there's a bifurcation in the two systems, uh, court security, law enforcement. We generally can fit both bills, but because of underfunding over uh, chronic underfunding over generations. Um, we uh, have seen struggles among sheriff's offices to be able to satisfy uh, the services needed. And that's where uh, the system of private security officers, state employees who are not related to law enforcement and then the sheriff's deputies have now filled it. Uh, we, um, what we asked for, uh, if we were compelled to provide uh, or security in each courthouse with one deputy in each courthouse. Really what we're asking for is the resources to do it. Uh, we have a system which we've demonstrated works that we can retain people. This is a state transport deputy program. And so that's where we went uh, to say, this is a system that we can deliver that. The, um, there are issues or I shouldn't say issues, hurdles uh, that I think with time uh, and with the correct stakeholders, uh, that we can work through those issues. Uh, we can talk about uh, the judiciary's need for uh, its uh, control of security uh, in the context of the statutes, but also from a constitutional perspective that they are a separate branch of government. Uh, we are concerned uh, 
if we don't have control of the resources, but we have the responsibility, we are left in a similarly awkward position that we have found ourselves in where we currently work across multiple segments and we say we're neither fish nor fowl. We don't really belong to the state. We don't really belong to the county. And we're not really sure who the third thing that we work with is, but that's the contracts. Uh, so it's just, I think my association's position aside from supporting the report is that we want to be uh, active partners for the judiciary. We want the resources to do the job uh, for the judiciary. And at the end of the day, um, we are uh, supportive of uh, finding solutions to the problem uh, that are simpler, not more complex. Just on the, uh, when you say resources, do you mean physical bodies or are you talking about the money and position? Uh, so it, fundamentally it's both. Uh, we, uh, I would articulate that it is the money that brings the bodies, because if I'm not competitive in wage and retirement and healthcare and whatnot, then I can't get the bodies. And that's one of the struggles that some of the, the departments have uh, identified. Uh, if we have, um, if we look to the state transport deputy model, those are consistent positions. They, we have oversight and management of those positions through the Department of State's attorneys and sheriffs, but it's the individual sheriff who's supervising and directing. So we maintain that local relationship with our local courthouses. Um, I've been to my courthouse several times. Uh, my deputies are there. Uh, we find uh, a lot of benefit. Uh, I'm gonna use the corporate word synergy. Uh, when we have state uh, transport deputies who interact with court security deputies, because we're able to operate within the, the constructs of our own policies and procedures. Uh, so we can say, hey, deputy needs to go get paperwork from the clerk's office. The person watching the monitor can monitor the, the person in a holding cell so that they don't say hang themselves. I'm not gonna trust that to a private security company who I have no relationship with. And so now I need to come up with a new resource to get the paperwork from the clerk's office. So um, I see a big picture uh, I see uh, deputy sheriffs doing this. Uh, we talked about, um, you heard that there's uh, resources for best practices. Um, across the country, sheriff's deputies do serve this function. Uh, there's other states where it's uh, the state police who serve this function. There's other states who have judicial marshals, which would be like the, uh, an analog would be the U.S. Marshal Service, who is the law enforcement uh, arm of the, the federal judicial branch. Um, we're currently serving this role, but I don't think we creating a, a separation from, uh, or maybe even a marriage between the executive and the judicial branches that's problematic to us just because it adds more complication how we function. Thank you. Representative Hooper. With your association hat on. Yes. Do you want this job or would it be, I mean, it seems to me like we're kind of Found a square peg in a round hole a little bit, and it might make sense to be considering something. It's freestanding. So I think the answer would be yes. Um, I don't think that is a unanimous agreement of the Sheriff's Association. Uh, we don't have a position on that per se, uh, and I'd be happy to, to identify one, of the things, um, which I think we could bring with the report. The um, sheriffs are already serving this role. Uh, and one of the, the other things, when we talk about the personnel filling these uh, positions, uh, the judiciary has been a great partner in teaching our deputies how to operate the, the very screening machines, metal detectors, x-ray machines, and they have that function. I can teach just about any cop that. Court officers is its own separate skill set. And so whether that is a law enforcement officer or not is a, a different conversation. Executive protection of a judge is an entirely different skill set. And so we can really quickly branch out and then we say, where do we train these resources? So um, back to your question, I think there would be a, a broad support and a majority support to do this. Um, often the sheriffs who are saying they don't support doing this is because they don't have the resources to do it because they can't hire. Well, and you brought up the issue of the sexual assault that happened in Costello. I think I was there. Uh, it, it, it makes clear to me that we have door security and we have courtroom security, but the courthouse is pretty much 
Wild West. And that's where we have a position we call a rover. Uh, and so the rover is basically a, a roving patrol of the building, staffed areas, public areas, lobbies, bathrooms. Uh, that's generally the idea. Um, but if you take the, the full-time equivalence of the judiciary uh, currently has, that's an average of three people per courthouse. We already know Costello has more than that. So it's, I mean, that's, a report is going to be enlightening, I think. And I would assume the argument that these should be permanent classified state employees sort of that go to work every day uh, has weight in that discussion. I, that would make the most sense to me uh, is to capture it that way, yes. Questions for Sheriff Anderson? So I guess we'll just, I'll just return to where we were at the beginning is that uh, you are in support uh, in concert with the judiciary of having them uh, report back in, uh, in the context of this bill. <laughs> we are in support of that. We are in support of the judiciary uh, conducting the study as opposed to the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs, not to say I speak for the department, but uh, it, it makes sense to the association that that happens as well. Uh, and uh, There we are. Cool. Well, thanks. Um, we will uh, I'll invite you to stick around for the rest of this discussion. Did you have another question? I was just going, I was just going to make a comment. Mr. Chair, it was interesting. It's kind of a little bit of a funny, but Sheriff Anderson also woven the other component of his life in the military. He said the bluff, the bottom line up front. That would be very interesting to hear. I've heard that one a bit. <laughs> we use that in the military a lot. This is the bottom line. This is what we're driving to. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> Thank you. It's the acronym. Yeah. Love it. I'm just learning a new one. Yeah, the, the love, the L U F. Great. So, uh, Steve, are, are you uh, going to be testifying or something? Okay. Uh, well, actually, I'd like to have uh, Prince Lewis come up with me if that's That's okay. totally fine with me. Uh, let's have the SEA representatives. In a past life, I had a great experience of having worked in the Costello Courthouse. So I have some experience in Vince. Um, in addition to being our lobbyist, is, a, is currently the state's attorney in Essex County and spends a great deal of his time in the courthouse. So we have some hands-on experience with uh, how, the, how court security actually works. Um, and I think we'd like to just start by saying um, that we uh, do support the report that's in Section 7A, but we have some suggestions which we think will make it stronger if, if you're willing to consider them. Um, first, I would just say that if um, the uh, importance of the report is um, really based on who is involved in the conversation. And so our recommendation is that we not just have the judiciary consult with folks, but that they work in conjunction with the folks who actually provide the security and in conjunction with the employees who actually need the security. Um, and so our first suggestion is on line 14 that we, that the, rather than saying in consultation with, that the judiciary would work in conjunction with um, the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs, the VSEA and the Sheriff's Association. And that we think would produce a recommendation to you that would be more represent, representative of all of the folks who um, uh, have actual experience with security um, from both the perspective of the management, but also the folks who are the consumers of the security um, and, uh, and also uh, those who would be providing it. Um, and I think it is really important to state that you heard from the Sheriff's Association, you're hearing from the VSEA, we represent the employees in the courthouses. Uh, and you heard from the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs when Andy Noonan testified that the model of the state paid deputies is the model that really is favored by, um, by at least those three entities. Um, and that really, I think, is important, important to state. Um, we make some, a couple of other suggestions uh, based on that testimony that we think would make this section stronger. Um, and that is to insert um, in the language where it says the number of state deputies that it be state paid deputies. Um, so on line 17, uh, where it says the, the committee shall report on the number of currently says sheriff's deputies, we think 
it, it should say state paid sheriff's deputies. Um, and the same on, on, um, on, uh, on line 21, we would not support weakening uh, the, the uh, end of that by removing the word similar to. Um, we think the intent of this section that makes it clear that the uh, model that we are looking at is one of the state paid deputies similar to the existing um, model uh, that we use for transport. We don't, as we said earlier in, in our earlier testimony, we don't need to reinvent the wheel here and we don't need to overly complicate uh, the situation. We already have an overly complicated security apparatus, as you heard in the courthouses. We have a current bargaining unit chaired by Representative Tom Oliver of state transport deputies. We can build on that model fairly easily. Um, and one thing that I think I would really stress is right now, the judiciary contracts for security from another branch of government. The, the sheriffs are another branch of government. So we are not asking them to do anything different that would any, in any way change the level of control they would have over the contract that would be in place. The contract would just be streamlined. It would be with the Department of State's attorneys and sheriffs rather than individual sheriffs. Um, it's, it's still contracting with a different form of government. It doesn't dissipate their power or control at all. And in fact, that is how the model is set up in the statute for the transport deputies. The sheriffs have designated the department to negotiate and to, um, and to uh, uh, enter into, an, into a contract with the various agencies that use the transport deputies. So this is, this is not asking them to do anything different than what they do now with the current, the current deputies and doesn't dissipate their power um, in any way from our standpoint. Um, so I don't know, Vince, if you had anything else you'd like well, to add to well, that. Sure. Thank you, uh, members of the committee, for allowing me to appear today. To answer the chair's question, I think you asked the question about the contract and who controls, if I understood the question correctly. At the present time, as I was told in the House version of the budget, there's about $6 million appropriated for security. And that's done by contract between the judiciary and 13 sheriff's departments. And so the contract specifies what services will be provided in exchange for X amount of dollars. And that is a contract with the executive, with another department, you know, sheriffs and law enforcement capacity are certainly considered executive branch and want law enforcement security. So uh, the judiciary also contracts with uh, the Department of Buildings and General Services for um, the, the, the maintenance in the courthouses, I, I presume it contracts for IT services. And so there's a, a, a lot of precedent for the judiciary entering into contracts with other departments or agencies. But ultimately the judiciary controls because the contract specifies the obligations of the contract E. And I think that's important to know in support of our position that we would like uh, to transition to 25 state paid deputies uh, to be assigned to the Department of State's attorneys and sheriffs. And then that department would contract as the judiciary does with other agencies and departments of state government to provide services uh, for security purposes. Now, since the pandemic in Addison County, uh, a state transport deputy has been providing courthouse security. There has been no issue. There has been no problem. There has been no failure to provide that security. And, uh, and uh, I just want to acknowledge that the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs has assisted the judiciary by assigning a state paid deputy to provide those services. It's been done flawlessly, seamlessly, uh, and, uh, and, and I want to acknowledge that. I also want to acknowledge, by the way, I meant to say this when I was going to begin my, my brief remarks, that uh, Annie Newman did come in. She's the person that oversees that department, and uh, she has made those services available to the judiciary because there was a need there there was a resource available and it was accomplished. No uh, fights, no uh, 
uh, issues or anything along those lines. And I also want to note, I saw that Judge Zoni is, Zoni is on the line, or at least was. He is absolutely loved by the judicial assistants and the staff in the Northeast Kingdom. And it's a working relationship already in progress. The courthouse security, the judicial assistants, uh, all work together. So this is not unprecedented. Um, so that's uh, that's our point. The contract governs the services to be provided. The judiciary always will be in control because it helps to write and enter into that contract. And so to ensure that that positive working relationship that's already in place with the chief administrative judge, with the court administrator, with the Department of State's attorneys, and with our members be reflected in that study. And so we would urge that you uh, ensure that the Vermont Sheriff's Association, the Vermont State Employees Association, and the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs be made part of that, uh, what you call it, task force or working I don't know what you're calling that. Just ask in this language for judiciary to give us a report back. Right. So uh, happy to add folks for them to consult with. In, in consultation <laughs> with something like yeah. that. Or in conjunction with. Yeah. Or in conjunction with. We're, I think there's an acknowledgement from the testimony we've heard uh, to answer that question that um, we're not we're not in a position right now to say in this next fiscal year we're going to we're going to do this whole new way, um, yeah. just like, but that we're, we're looking for more information from those stakeholders uh, but, but ahead of the next session. They are the stakeholders in place now, seamlessly providing courthouse security, and we think that should be built on and not some new uh, enterprise created. That's it. Representative Hango has a question. Thank you. 25 statewide deputies, are they sworn law enforcement oper uh, officers? officers? I can't even yes. talk today. Um, certified by your... the Vermont Criminal, <laughs> it's called the Vermont Criminal Justice Training Council anymore. It's called the Vermont Criminal Justice Council. Criminal Justice, Criminal Justice, Criminal Justice, Council. Council. Justice Council. Council, yes. And they exercise law enforcement authority, have the power of arrest, and that's why they're clearly an executive branch, an executive branch. Questions for Steve or Vince? Thank you, gentlemen, very Thank much for you. your time. Um, so, committee, uh, what we're, we have about 15 minutes here before our scheduled break. Um, so, I wanted to have a little bit of discussion, take a break. Uh, we have scheduled testimony, a walkthrough of the Vermont Cities Bill S135, and then we're going to come back to the Sheriff's Bill. Um, and uh, talk about some of the ethics section. So before we move on from uh, the court security sections, I just wanted to get a feel, uh, given the testimony that we've heard both today and previously on, on these, I want to throw out a couple questions for folks to consider and have a little committee discussion time. So um, it, you probably have noticed a theme that as we've, gone through these, a couple of the mandates that came over, um, I want to just make sure that we're being thoughtful about sort of how those will work in reality. Um, and, and so this section seven piece about saying we're going to have one deputy sheriff be at the courts, I think everybody wants to head in that direction. The question is, how do we provide that given that there are various levels of resources throughout the state uh, and that that works, that may be working. It may work and be an easy thing to satisfy, uh, but it isn't everywhere else. Um, and then, you know, sort of if there are specific thoughts about um, exactly what wording we need to see in this report back language. So I'll open it up. Does anyone have like questions or, or strong feelings about updates to the section seven and seven A representative Hango? Thanks. 7A, I think, should address something about that um, funding is provided for this um, this ask. I mean, we I don't know where the funding would come from. It, it does say any corresponding budget request for these positions. So similar to 
So I think we need to be clear that the report should also report back on where would the money come from to fund these positions. Yeah, I think the, the, the general idea of why there's a report here and not an explicit we're doing this is uh, that the memo that we got back from uh, Terry and Greg was that there's patchwork and the, the money that we budgeted for the security is being spent in a bunch of different ways. And so we don't want to break the thing that isn't giving us all the courthouse security that we want by mandating a new thing. So we're asking them to give us some more information and be thoughtful over the next few months about how to provide that. And I think we could be more explicit about uh, the funding, but I think that's the core issue uh, here is sort of how do we, how would we move from the patchwork that we have today that we are spending, you know, $6 million a year on, is that the, you know, what would, be the right number and how many of those people that are providing courthouse security need to be these more deputies versus, um, you know, a, a new <clears throat> officer might be uh, more useful for them in certain instances. We don't really know that, but this idea being laid on the table of using the state transport deputies as a model that we've heard a bunch of times, uh, it seems. <clears throat> Like before we can make any kind of decision about that, we would need some more information. Senator Waters Evans. Can you just tell me like super simply, just to help me here, <clears throat> what problem are we trying to solve? So I would say that there's a couple of things. Some courts from what we've heard from uh, our representatives from the judicial branch, uh, can't operate at certain times or have to do it in a limited or awkward way, like having somebody lock the doors and run up into a courtroom in order yeah. to staff it. Um, because we do, we have um, limited staffing and yeah. budgeted for pretty limited staffing to provide courthouse security. So what originally came over to us was in this language in section seven, a sheriff shall provide a minimum of one deputy sheriff certified as a law enforcement officer, right? So we've got that sort of yeah. like mandate, but then we've also heard from the sheriffs that some places that would be fine, but in other places there isn't any sheriff's deputy right now providing courthouse security. And that would be great if we could find that person, but we would need to figure that out. And so the Senate in S-17 pushed the, the date, the start date for that mandate out a year to July of 2024. To do the report. Well, no, to actually just have the mandate, but they still didn't address the things that the report's asking, which is who should these people be? Should they be the sheriff's deputies? And if we went to a model of having them be state employees like the transport deputies, how could that work? And how many deputies would work in that model and fill the gaps? Because what we all want to get to is to have safe courtrooms that are open when they need to be open. <laughs> so that's the bigger problem that we're trying to solve. Okay. I, I mean, that's that's what I thought was the problem, but it seems to me this might be a really simplistic way I'm thinking. But I think if you're just asking somebody to do something, you have to give them the money to pay for it, correct? Right. So doesn't it seem like a budget issue more, or it's not like a, a money thing rather than whatever else all this is which makes sense but it's it's the money but it's also from the testimony we've heard from both the sheriffs and from the court administrator it's about who who do those deputies work for and are they contracted or are they stay employees <laughs> and that is a question i don't think this committee has enough information to answer just yet that was my next question which is if it's mandated by the legislature that they hire them then they would be state employees because it's not no it's not a natural we just tell the sheriffs hey you have to provide a deputy that's that's what came over from the senate is starting in july of 2024 you have to provide a deputy for every courthouse sounds great on paper but we so what i'm trying to take some responsibility for here is to say actually let's work with the courts and the department and the sheriffs and the employees association and other stakeholders if they want to weigh in here and try to figure this out. So the first step of that was asking the judiciary to 
work with some of those stakeholders because they volunteered. Thank you very much, Terry, um, to work uh, this year on a report back for okay. us to, to help us because I think we're, we have a direction to point in, but we're just not, we don't have all the information we need to get there. Representative Hanga. Thank you. So building on Representative Waters <coughs> Evans' question, which was similar to mine, like what about the funding for this? Doesn't this report ask them to do what you're asking us our opinions on right now? I'm not sure what you're asking us for. I'm asking you if, based on everything you've heard, if this structure, <laughs> the first question is, is this structure of saying we're going to delay any implementation of this mandate and ask for a report back, if the committee feels like that's a sensible way to proceed. And then if there are specific questions or other things, like can we be a little more explicit about funding? Sure, uh, about that being an ask. Um, it's like, what would it cost to, to do this? So with any recommendations you have, just trying to get, get at that in this language, any corresponding budget requests for these positions was how I, and Mr. Devlin, uh, tried to capture that, but I just want to make sure that the, the structure is sort of amenable to me that nobody's got any heartburn about sort of doing a faint in this direction, but saying, hey, we need some more information so we can act, act on this and help support the judiciary security, uh, hopefully in next year's session. Is that Morgan and then Representative um, on this, uh, so I can see we're going to work on this afternoon and then looking to try to mark a, a final mark of a potential vote tomorrow morning. Did um, I know Sheriff Anderson testified on part of it? Do we want to give him one last crack at it somewhere? Because I think this is new language to him and his peers, correct? Just to go, because I mean, they're a major, they're the major stakeholder in this, obviously. And I just want to make sure we don't have some unintended consequences. I guess I'm being a little probably uh, over whatever on that, but you know what I mean? Just one last, here's your final, here's your last word. What do you think? Yeah, um, ha happy to do that. Um, I think what, what I was hearing loud and clear from Sheriff Anderson, not to put words in his mouth, but to try to summarize is that the there's a sense of relief from the association that we're uh, being thoughtful about this mm -hmm. mandate that was included uh, and that there's the very strong implication that by the time we get to next year, we're gonna be looking at this issue in more in depth than you're saying, yep, you gotta put a sheriff in every courthouse. Yeah, every court. yeah I just, and then, and then in general, the whole, the whole schmear before we go, yeah, oh, yeah. sounds good, vote, yep, yep, we're all oh, good. Oh, yes. One yeah. last, one last yeah. cut out of the go. Uh, These guys gotta live with it. Yeah, and there's, there, are, there are a couple of other sections that I'd love to hear more from Sheriff Anderson on. I think I mentioned that earlier that, uh, that we haven't gotten into, so I'm gonna stay focused. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. Possible markup and vote tomorrow. <laughs> we, may have, we may have more work. <laughs> uh, Representative Hango, go ahead. Thank you. I'm still trying to um, compare the notes that I had had questions on with this new draft, because I just saw the new draft when we sat down. And I don't know if all the things that I brought up as um, questions on Friday were actually addressed in this new draft. So when would we address those? if I find some that have not been addressed. I would say that um, I am working and have been all weekend on the notes that I had from our testimony last week. That's what resulted in this draft. I've already received some feedback, both from Sheriff Anderson uh, and from others. And we heard some testimony today that I think uh, might have some tweaks to this section. So um, it really is, you know, this afternoon and tomorrow morning, um, I would say, if, if you've got any big burning thing that you want to get into the conversation that we need to look at, um, sooner is better because this bill is, we're going to try to get it uh, into a shape where we can take a vote in the next day or two. And, uh, you know, it'll be the bulk of our work this afternoon, obviously, and tomorrow. So later this afternoon, if I find that there are things that haven't been addressed in the new draft, bring them up then? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And we'll, tomorrow, we're going to spend some significant work on this bill. So hope is that we can address any major issues in the next 24 hours and have something we can vote on in the next day or two. Right. Uh, great. Well, then let's um, take a little break and uh, 
we will be back here. If everybody here would be ready to go at 2.45, that would be fantastic. So this is a little bit longer than a 15 minute break. Welcome back everybody after a break here. Um, we are picking up with um, an introduction of S-135 and act relating to the establishment of Vermont Saves. Senator Brock, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. For the record, it's Randy Brock uh, from the Senate. Uh, I, I will just tell you the same thing that I told the Senate when I presented this bill on the floor. And I rarely say anything like this. I love this bill. Oh. <laughs> it's a great bill. Uh, and I love it for a variety of reasons. <clears throat> One, it solves a problem, or at least begins to solve a problem that we as a state had. It doesn't cost a lot of money to actually start up and do, and nor does it have a lot of continuing expense. It doesn't cost the taxpayers any future money, and it doesn't raise taxes. It actually gives something back to individual Vermonters, and it gives something back to the state because it ultimately has the potential of saving us money. And last but not least, we're not the first in the nation to do it. And that's pretty important because so often what happens is we pass things, we're the first in the nation to do it, and then we pay the price because we don't know how to do it. Here, we have a number of other states who've done this already, so we can measure what they've done and the kind of success that they achieve. Essentially, what the bill does it, is it takes a look at a problem. And the problem is that only 5% of Americans without workplace retirement savings are saving for retirement. And more than half of small employers don't offer retirement saving plans. Two thirds of individuals without a workplace plan have less than $10,000 saved for retirement. And most Vermonters don't have adequate emergency savings. <clears throat> when an employer does not offer a retirement savings plan, on average, the statistics tell us that fewer than 5% of its employees are saving for retirement. But when an employer does offer such a plan, over 70% of employees participate in that plan. Vermonters who aren't covered by retirement plans are lower earning, younger, less educated, more likely to be BIPOC, more likely to be female. And as a result, uh, historically, uh, Vermonters and Americans in disadvantaged groups are less prepared for financially secure retirement than others. 60%, 63% of savers without an employer plan have less than $10,000. And that's significant. Our plan that's contained in this particular bill is a Roth IRA. And there are two kinds of IRAs. There's a Roth IRA and there's a traditional IRA. The Roth IRA is distinguished because it's contributed with after-tax money uh, from its savers. Uh, regular uh, IRAs are, are pre-tax money. The advantage of the Roth IRA, particularly for the groups that we're talking about, is it's always their money. They don't have to wait until they're retired or they don't have to suffer a penalty to take their own money out of the plan. And this plan, as proposed, is both a retirement savings plan, which is principal purpose, and that's how it's used in other states more than anything else. But it also is an emergency savings plan. You know, the people who have some sort of a medical emergency right now in Vermont, uh, more than half, if not more, of Vermonters who are employed, who don't have retirement plans, have less than $1,000 available to meet an emergency. And that's pretty significant. What this plan does is it puts money aside. The earnings from that money, yes, you can't take out without some sort of a penalty early because that's tax advantage money. But the money that you put in is your money. It's after tax money. You can take it out whenever you want to. The plan offers a lot of flexibility because every employer by employee by default is put into the plan if they don't have a, a retirement plan already. But they can immediately opt out. The plan talks about using a 5% rate, which is consistent with what this other states have done, but uh, an employee can decide it's anything less than that, including zero at any point in time. It's payroll deduction, uh, and the payroll deduction, again, the emphasis is, is their money. Among the advantages of programs like this is uh, 
People who don't have plans depend on Social Security for retirement, and usually not an awful lot of it. And we all know that as one who gets Social Security, it's not a lot of money. It's not enough money for many people to be able to live on in retirement. By supplementing the amount of money that is available that people, in fact, save, uh, we make people stronger so that they are better able to achieve retirement. But we also help the state because it potentially saves us money because when people don't have the money to be able to support themselves, the state winds up supporting them or contributing to their support. So this is a plan that's designed to make people more self-sufficient. It also is designed to make the individuals wealthier, both in terms of what they are able to save themselves. But just as important, uh, by setting that money aside, it means that they are better prepared for emergencies and they're better prepared for retirement. Every year that you could defer retirement from your first available date at age 62 up to the normal retirement date of age 67, every year you can delay taking Social Security money out will increase the earnings that you can take out or the money that you can take out from Social Security up to 7 to 8 percent for every year thereafter for the rest of your life. That's significant, particularly as we're all learning to live longer. By and large, uh, we, uh, we heard from a lot of people about this particular bill. Among the things, of course, that we heard is what's happened in other states that have put these together. In Oregon and California, savers are setting aside an average of about $2,000 per year. Total assets under management in the six active states that have this plan right now, $735 million as of January 31st of this year. And the average account balances are growing rapidly. There are 12 states at this point who have passed this legislation, six of which are active and the others are in the process. And what we're seeing is that uh, these numbers are growing, both in terms of states, minimum costs to establish such a plan, uh, no cost to employers at all involved in, in the plan, uh, and the fact that employees have full control over their money. This has a phase rollout. Employers with 25 uh, employees or more by July 1 of 2025, 15 to 24 by July 1 of 2026, and 5 to 14 employers by July 1 of 2026. We're also looking at under five uh, employers. Uh, the Treasurer's Office, I know, is looking at that. Oregon is currently in the process of rolling out an under five. And again, we'll have an example to look at with sufficient time to do so to see if that makes sense and to say that it works. That basically is the bill in a nutshell. We heard from uh, representatives of the Treasurer's Office, we've heard from AARP, and we heard from the Department of Aging and Independent Living, and we haven't heard anything opposed to it. Everything has been in favor. Uh, and this is something that we, I strongly recommend uh, for your committee to, to take a serious look at. Well, thank you uh, for giving us the initial sales pitch on the bill. Uh, <laughs> These folks on the committee have questions for the Senate reporter here, Senator Representative Higley. Senator, thank you. And I know my own personal history is getting out of the service at age 22. I didn't have an idea at all as far as you know, what I would be saving for. Fortunately, I had a friend who was selling home life insurance policies who convinced me to invest in that. Uh, so that's basically what I had for a long time. I guess my question is, is um, that I haven't really looked things over yet or, or talked to the treasurer, but um, what about getting uh, young people interested? Is, is there a campaign around this to make sure that they have some sort of an understanding as to how important this is? Because I think for me at 22, it would have helped me to have somebody explain to me a little bit closer as to, hey, you know, this, you're going to need this in the future. Uh, that's absolutely correct. I, I know that the Treasurer's Office has things in mind that they perhaps can describe to you, uh, but I've heard talk around the building from time to time that, gee, wouldn't it be great to have financial literacy be something that is uh, a thing that almost every kid in school ought to be learning something about? And that's the first, this is the first step. Thank you. Representative Morgan. Yep, thank you. Uh, so, Senator, it's just, if I read it clearly, I just... I, the answer is yes, but there's it's 100% employee funded, no contrib no matching contributions of any sort. No matching contributions. In fact, there can't be matching contributions. Some have asked, well, gee, can an employer decide to off uh, to, to put in some money 
to help the employee? And the answer is unfortunately no, because uh, otherwise, if you have an employer employer sponsored plan like a by a 401k or, right. or, or similar, you are entangled in ERISA, the Employee Retirement Income Security Act, which is a nightmare, extremely complex and also extremely costly in the long run. So by having it belonging entirely to the employer, it makes it simpler, makes it cleaner, makes it easier to administer, makes it less costly uh, for, uh, for, for the state. And it also, I think, makes it a lot clearer to the employee, it's his money or her money. And you can go one, two, three, four, five percent of your choice up to that five. Up to that five. And there is uh, there are provisions in the bill to actually increase the top limit that one can deduct in future years. Great. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, can you give me some background on why the implementation is over three years when particularly a shocking number of employers in Vermont or under 10 employees, under 15 employees, and they seem to be the most in need, maybe. And I, th I think it's principally, and I'll let the treasurer explain his motive for setting that, that limit up, but I think the principal reason is prudence, that uh, by starting out more slowly uh, with larger employers, we get more experience in how uh, folks in Vermont are reacting to the deductions and how employers are administering it and making sure that we don't create administrative burdens that would require additional state employees, state staff, state IT resources. This is entirely one, and, and again, it's one of the things I love about it. It doesn't require us to set up a new uh, uh, employee system to, to be able to deduct this from, uh, from employers. This is an going to be administered entirely by a third party administrator, which is frequently the case with, with, with retirement savings plans that large corporations do. And again, it's, it's to minimize the overhead uh, and by going more slowly, I think we can be more prudent. I would expect though, that if this is spectacularly successful in the beginning and spectacularly easy to administer, that uh, we, would, we would think again about perhaps accelerating. Thank you, Senator Brack, for Thank you. giving us the first look at the bill. Um, I'd like to invite Treasurer Pichak to take the chair next. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks to the committee, and thank you to Senator Brock, who did a great job overviewing the merits of the bill and I think some of the details uh, as well. So maybe I'll just start with the, some of the questions that were asked that I could provide a little bit more detail on. So to Representative Higley's question, um, you know, there are two positions that will be funded out of the Vermont saves, not uh, as the senator said from uh, tax revenue, but from fees that uh, will be charged to individual members, fees that are low and uh, much lower than what they'd charge in a 401k. So that is the good news. Um, but one of those positions would be an outreach coordinator uh, whose focus would be both to work with businesses to make sure they're prepared uh, for um, the program implementation, but also to work with employees and work with employers to work with their employees to understand the benefits uh, of such a program. And as you point out, I mean, there's a tremendous number of younger workers that are in this category of not being covered by a workplace retirement plan. So a tremendous number of, of younger uh, Vermonters that would be covered under Vermont Saves. And, the ability to save in your 20s and in your 30s uh, really would be quite significant over the rest of your lifetime. So that certainly will be a message that we'll be working on uh, getting across to everybody. Um, and to Representative Hooper's uh, question, you know, the so the bill passes this this session, then we'll have two years basically until the first employers are uh, participating uh, in the program. So we will have to hire the director of the program. Uh, we'll have to secure the vendors. Uh, there's two vendors, primarily one that would work with the businesses to set up payroll deductions, to set up the Roth IRAs. Then there's a vendor that would provide the actual investments that will be in and available to those with the Roth IRAs. That could take a little bit of time. Uh, they'll have to get their website specific to Vermont. We'll want to test that with some employers. We'll want to do outreach to those employers to make sure they're familiar with the program that's coming down the pike. And then once that starts in July 2025, you know, basically six months, another group will come on. Six months, the last group will come on. And that's just to make sure we can pivot if anything, you know, turns out to be uh, an issue during the implementation. Um, I will say, as the senator pointed out, that could be accelerated. Uh, Vermont's a smaller state. The state of Colorado just went through their first phase 
and had over 120,000 employees sign up uh, on a single day. So, you know, even if we're successful, we'll have maybe 65,000 employees in total for the whole program. So it's something that I think a vendor could handle if we ended up implementing it on one day instead of over multiple periods. Does our current PC administrator do this? Do, uh, the, they're not one of the vendors. Yeah. Right down cost. Yeah. Well, one thing that could drive down costs even more um, is working with a vendor that certainly has worked with other states just because they have experience with this program, but then potentially partnering with another state uh, that, you know, the couple of likely candidates would be our neighbor, Connecticut, that has passed this. Rhode Island is in the process of passing it this session. So if both of those states stood up a very similar program, Connecticut's already stood it up, but if Rhode Island follows suit, then we'll have a couple of New England neighbors that we could potentially partner with to drive the fees down even more. And how large a range of funds would individuals have, or is it simply a savings? So the, the, the you know generally in these other states, Connecticut has a wide variety relative to some. But if you think of it as like six or seven target date funds, so there's a, like a secure holdings fund, which is you know pretty risk adverse. And then maybe there's a target fund 10 years out, you know, 15, 20, 25, 30, and so on. So if an employee does no action, you know, they're defaulted into the plan, the money is defaulted into a Roth IRA for them, their money would go into a target date that most closely aligns with their likely retirement age and likely retirement date. So they would uh, have that choice made for them. They could go in and put it into the secure, you know, uh, investment. They could put it into something more aggressive. Um, so there'll be a limited range, which sort of helps with uh, making sure people don't, you know, folks that might not be as experienced with investing really can't go too far, yeah. you know, uh, and get themselves. Thank you. Uh, thank you for revamping the conversation on this. I know it's been going on for quite a few years. Um, so the, the states that have implemented already, what kind of participation rate are they seeing? Yeah, so uh, the early states like Oregon, Illinois, California have reported 70 to 75 percent of the employees stay in the program. Uh, the specific number that gets thrown around is 73 percent, okay. uh, but between 70 and 75 percent are remaining opted into the program. And then and that's in the first year of the of the operation. So I think a natural question would be, well, what about the second year? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're reporting back that like over north of 95 percent of folks are staying in the program like year over year. So um, it makes sense, like like this inertia that's preventing people from signing up on their own for a plan like this is something that's also working in their favor once it's provided to them, that inertia of continuing to save year over year over year uh, once it's uh, done for you automatically and taken care of from a payroll deduction. Okay, now those are stronger numbers than I thought you were going to cite, so that's certainly encouraging. Yeah, no, it's what really encouraged us to look at this program that these other states have implemented. They're just, their success rate has been quite, you know, quite surprising in a good way. Is it? And, and the, the, the states that have been implemented for a greater period of time, um, do you have any kind of for us to think that that maybe shows like a breakdown in ranges, like see what the demos are or anything like that, just as a... So... There's a slide that we presented in our presentation that's slide three. And it just breaks down the Vermont expectation in terms of age. You know, there's, a, there's an estimate of 88,000 Vermonters that don't have a, uh, a workplace retirement plan. And then right below that, there's sort of the age breakdown. And we don't have any data that suggests it would be different than how the 73% would fall based on each of these categories. So I think it would be disproportionately younger. You know, you can see that almost 50% of the folks that um, don't have workplace retirement are under the age of 34 um, with, you know, the other cohorts having about 15,000 or so uh, in them beyond that. So that's great to be able to offer something to someone that that's that, that young to be able to start saving where now they're basically saving nothing. Yeah, that's all I have. Represent who? Embarrassing question. Yeah. Is there a cap on the amount you can put in Roth? Yes, there is. Uh, I think and for this year, it's 6,500. 
it's uh, contemplated potentially go up. It usually goes up every number of years. Um, the average savings that the other states are seeing are $2,000 a year. So it doesn't seem like generally people are running into that cap. Um, these are, gen like we were talking about, lower wage earners. You know, $2,000 aside is a significant portion of their overall income, and it's post-tax as well. Um, so there is, but um, we have found, these other states have found that that cap has worked for them for this program. One thing the Senator didn't mention, which I do want to make sure I get across, is that the federal government has um, enacted a revamped savers credit. So the savers okay. credit is coming into play in uh, 2027. And if you are a lower wage earner, so that seems to be someone making $70,000 or lower, sort of tiered out at about 70,000, and you're saving money into a qualified retirement plan on your own, and the federal government will make a direct deposit annually, basically a federal match of up to $2,000 into your qualified retirement account. So um, you can imagine a scenario where somebody has qualified by income, they're saving $2,000 on their own, and the federal government then puts $2,000 also into their account. And that would be every year that they're saving themselves into that qualified retirement account. So we, you know, another reason to, to move on this now and to get working on it is to make sure as many Vermonters as possible are in a position to get that federal match starting in 2027. Representative. Is that program guaranteed to continue? Starting in 2027, but is it guaranteed to continue or is that? There's no sunset, you know, anything Congress can always, you know, change its mind, but there's no, it's not a pilot program or a program with a sunset, <laughs> you know, it's intended to go on indefinitely, as far as I know. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so as people age, um, so it looks like from the demographics in your slides, like roughly half the people who initially enrolled or people who are kind of 35 or younger employees and, and would we assume based on what you said in Senator Brack that you know they're gonna get the biggest benefit of having these savings over time because it's a lot of a longer time for retirement. When as they age in their careers and get into jobs that have retirement savings, will these plans kind of exist alongside as a separate savings? Uh, from employee employer plans, or do you envision people kind of rolling their their IRA from Vermont Saves into other plans as they get older, or will it kind of be up to each individual's? Yes, yeah, so, so I think, uh, Chair, the most likely scenario would that the Roth IRA would just remain sort of parallel to whatever other retirement plan is offered to them, 401k or pension system or something else. They can con continue to yeah. contribute to the Roth IRA separate, you know, uh, just they would have to be their money into an automatic payroll deduction. Um, and same thing if an employer, you know, if an employee goes from employer one to employer two, and they're both in this program, their one Roth IRA account would follow from employer one to employer two. It's portable in that way. If they left the state, um, if they, you know, worked for another employer in Vermont that offered another retirement plan, like we talked about, all of those provide that portability that either it it, it ports up with another employer participating in this plan, or it just exists as a, you know, independent vehicle that they can continue to put money into in the future. Representatives, would the cap on a Roth, like if they move to a job where they get a four hundred one k, would those two caps interfere with each other? So they're separate. There'd be separate caps. So you have the IRA cap is a little bit higher, like more. It used to be seventeen thousand five hundred. It, it might still be there, going up to twenty two thousand, I believe. Um, so that would be one cap, and then you'd have your Roth IRA cap. On top of that? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Maybe just one thing just to mention to the Representative Morgan's question. The 5%, um, you can, an employee can decide to go higher than the 5% on their own as well. Okay. So if they wanted it to be 10% on their own, they could go in and do that as well as making it lower. So it's flexible both right. ways. Okay. And, um, and then I think the Senator mentioned under five is not uh, you know, required to participate in this, but an individual or a small employer can on their own participate in it if they'd like to. If they choose. Yeah. But they just, the percentage would, they would be halted when they hit the cap though. Yeah. Obviously you like the cap. 10%, I was making 70,000, I can't hit 10% because it's going to exceed the- Right, exactly right. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. Okay. 
Thank you. Thank you, Treasurer, for being with us. I yeah, thank you very much. Um, I asked Legislative Council to give us kind of a, a brief jog through so we can orient ourselves to the bill and, um, and then I'll pull the committee, but it seems like there's a lot of support for this one. So I wanted to make sure we had the chance to take it up in the waning days of the session. Well, I really appreciate that. Let's move it. <laughs> yeah, I really appreciate that. Great. Thank you so much. So Becky, if you're ready, um, please join us. Thanks for being here this afternoon. Um, yeah. Last friend, Legislative Council. So I can let me know if you want more detail, but I will give you more of an overview. Um, so this is uh, S-135, which establishes the Vermont SAFES program. So this is creating a new chapter in Title III um, that is adding all the language to administer this program. Um, so there are a number of sections in section one that's adding that new chapter of law um, that sort of detail all the logistics to creating a new program. Uh, so I can generally explain what the, the sections are. So section, um, the new section 531 in section one on page one is the definitions that would relate to um, the, this new chapter of law. Um, and uh, I would just point you to page two. Um, this is where uh, there's a definition in subdivision two on line seven for a covered employee, as well as a covered employer on um, line 20. So I think there were some questions over um, who would be captured by this program. Um, and so this is outlined there. Um, so an employee is someone who is 18 years or older and is employed by a covered employer. Um, it can include a part-time seasonal or temporary employee um, if that's permitted by the treasurer's office. And then there's some restrictions on what a covered employee does not include. And then with respect to a covered employer, um, it is, you know, any person or entity um, in the state, and it can be a pro uh, for-profit or uh, non-profit that has not offered to its employee um, in any time within the current calendar year or two preceding calendar years, a specified tax-favored retirement plan. So I just wanted to highlight that um, this is capturing employee employers who have not in the last two years offered this plan um, to their employees. Uh, so um, just any questions on that? So we're, we're talking about employees who don't have a retirement plan that's provided by their employer who are 18 or over. Right, in, in the last two years. Yeah. Um, and I can, I, I'm happy to go through more definitions, but if this is the level of detail you want, I can skip to um, page five, section 532, which is establishing the program. Um, so that is on uh, line 18 of page five. So the program is, um, administered by the treasurer's office and the purpose is stated as increasing financial security for Vermonters by providing access uh, to an IRA for Vermont employees and companies that do not currently offer a retirement savings program. Um, and then there's some language about how the program should be designed. So it's, it's meant to facilitate portability of benefits through withdrawals, withdrawals, rollovers and direct transfers from an IRA achieve economies of scale and other efficiencies to minimize costs. Um, so as you've heard, the program requires that a covered employee offer the choice to the covered employee to contribute to the program. So there, it's a mandatory enrollment, but then the uh, employee can decide to opt out once they've been enrolled in the program. Um, and then in subsection B, it specifies that the type of um, IRA that is used will be an 
a Roth IRA, but there is language that allows the treasurer to um, authorize an option for a traditional IRA to be used instead of a Roth IRA. Um, and then in subsection C, it talks about the contribution. So I'm on the bottom of page six. So I think you just, just heard this, but there will be um, an automatic initial contribution of 5% of the covered employee's salary or wages. Um, but then, of course, the employee can opt out or can choose to um, con contribute at a higher or lower rate. Um, and then on page seven in subdivision two under contributions, the treasurer um, will also provide for an annual increase of the contribution rate um, by not less than 1%, but not more than 8% of salary or wages each year. Um, and then of course the employee still has the opportunity to opt out of that uh, increase, do more or do less than that amount. So it starts with a 5% contribution and then phases in up to 8.1% per year. Yes. Um, there oh. is that an automatic, like the first month would be at the increased rate and then they could change it back or like, can they say, no, don't make any changes? Um, so it says it applies to active person participants, um, including participants by default with an option to opt out. So uh, I actually, I don't know if the way that the rules would be set up for a program would allow them sort of give notification and allow them to opt out ahead of time. Um, but perhaps the treasurer's office can answer that question. Yeah. For the record, uh, Deputy Treasurer Gavin Hoyles, I, it would be set up so that the person could opt out before the, the new elevated. Uh, contribution rate would, would kick in for that. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and just other things um, to note on page seven, subdivision four says that uh, covered employees are not permitted or required to make contributions under the program. So I just wanted to highlight that. Um, and Uh, page eight, under the administration of the program, um, the treasurer can administer uh, in the program um, through the treasurer's office or contract with a vendor to administer the program and manage the investments. Um, I think you just heard a little about that as well. There's a question. Back to four, just this limit the contributions to only those made through their employer or can they um, as being a Roth make individual contributions into this this is limiting the employer for making contributions yeah yeah but say an employer does a Christmas bonus and says if you'd like this too Yes. Um, so my understanding is that if the employer contributes into this plan, then it um, it sort of triggers ERISA. Yeah, it does. Laws. So I think that no, it's, it's, a, it's a somebody's going to try to get around the back door. Um, it's different. I don't know that I can I can answer how that would be handled, but I think the idea is that the employer should not be uh, making contributions into this account but in the example representative Hooper mentioned where an employer gives a bonus it's totally up to the employee as long as it's the employee's money they can put money from a bonus right a Roth, okay right? Yeah. yeah sorry i thought you were saying yeah. the employer like, yeah. 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 Like, yeah. No. so i don't think the employer could I, sorry i thought your question was whether an employer could can deposit a bonus into the account and i think the answer is no but you're saying if somebody receives a bonus they can decide how they yeah, want yeah. to use that money. As long as it's the employee's direction of that, of those funds into the account. And they haven't exceeded the cap. Yeah, wow, that's well, uh, well, well, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, um, there's, uh, language under the administration of the program uh, so that 
the treasurer has to design and implement the program in a matter, manner that's consistent with federal law. Um, and here's uh, in this language in subdivision one on page eight, uh, it says that um, the program uh, cannot be preempted by and the payroll deduction IRAs and covered employers not be subject to ERISA. So that goes to that uh, issue that was just raised. Um, the treasurer is uh, tasked with setting up a, a number of processes and requirements in order to administer the program in subdivision three. Um, so have to do with um, in, enrollment and contributions, um, automatic enrollment by, by payroll deduction, uh, processes for participants to make non-payroll contributions to accounts under the program. So that might go to that question that um, was just raised. So there are a number of, and then also the, the issue I raised before about determining whether a part-time seasonal or temporary employee is a covered employee that's eligible to participate. Um, so the treasurer will be making sort of a number of um, processes and, and rules related to setting up this program. Um, under subsection E, the treasurer has to maintain separate records and accounting for each account under the program, and the participants uh, get to maintain their accounts regardless of the place of employment and rollover funds into other IRAs or other retirement accounts. So it's meant to allow for portability of these retirement funds. Page 10, um, there's a reporting requirement that the treasurer sends a report to each participant detailing the status of their <clears throat> account. Subsection G, there's some um, outreach requirements on the treasurer's office. They, uh, the treasurer will conduct outreach to individuals, employers, and other stakeholders and the public regarding um, the uh, contents, frequency, timing, and means of required disclosures from the program to employees, participants, and, and those who are eligible to participate in the program. And subsection H deals with um, the monies and the, the participant accounts. So interest, investment earnings, and investment losses are allocated to each um, individual participant's account. Um, and the participants benefit under the program is equal to the balance in their account, in their um, account uh, let's see, the program assets in subsection I on page 10, um, the treasurer is authorized to establish a trust account um, to hold these assets. And none of the assets in the program on, on page 11 can be transferred to the general fund or any other fund of the state. Um, Subsection J, there is a fee that the treasurer is allowed to charge to defray program costs. The treasurer is authorized to set the amount and method of collection of the fee. Um, however, the fee cannot exceed $30 per participant in each calendar year. And the employer is, um, it, no employer is required to fund that uh, fee from the participants. Section 532 on page 11 um, just sets out the duties of the treasurer for setting up the program. This includes a number of um, rules that would be adopted to govern the program. Uh, the treasurer is also able to enter into um, different contracts and agreements to um, administer the program and um, establish different criteria and guidelines for the program. I feel like I'm, I'm rushing through, so I can... <laughs> yeah, so I guess what I would say, given that um, today was kind of our get a flavor for what this bill does, I think you've done uh, a great job of um, filling in some of the details and answering some of our questions. I know there will be more. Uh, what I wanted to get a flavor from the committee was now that we've gotten a little bit of testimony on this and a jog through some of the sections so you've got a little bit of an understanding of what we're talking about here. Um, should we try to take some testimony and work on this 
uh, over the next few days because it's got to go to money committees if we're going to get out of here this year. Um, I also wanted to get a sense of um, what the, uh, I assume the Senate included this in the budget. This might be a question for the deputy treasurer. Um, mm -hmm. What the costs are for staffing for the personnel you need. There's uh, a $750,000 appropriation in the budget. 750000 for, for the first year, for this, this coming fiscal year. Yeah, it's just one time for mm -hmm. staffing and then coverage. Because yeah. the program pays for itself once it's exactly. set up right now. Is it paid for two over time? Yeah. There are actually three positions contemplated. We're not sure we need all three. But okay. Just the loan? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so there, part of the reason I squeezed this in today uh, was that I could sense the excitement about this bill from a few members of this committee and other people and the treasurer, of course. Um, so I just wanted to make sure we were all kind of, we got a chance to take a quick look this week and then if we can get it, uh, start our work uh, and have Becky back for a real walkthrough <laughs> with all the gory details and looking at every line um, and get some testimony. Um, we, I think we can accommodate that if we're uh, nimble over the next few days, Representative Byron. Yeah, I just wanted to add to the conversation just a little bit like this. So this is kind of a continuation of, uh, for the newer members, uh, agreement on secure retirement with the, which the legislature passed in, I believe, was it 16? So 17, yeah. something like that. Yeah, and um, that was a piece before I got in, I worked with some of the business organizations and I was very enthused about it, but it just, there were some hiccups. And so I was very encouraged to see this get taken back up. So I just want to put an enthusiastic endorsement to work on this on the table. And, and I would note, uh, just on the last page of the, the bill in section three, um, there's a repeal section. So what that is doing is repealing that program because this um, program may be taking it. Yeah. I would echo what Representative Byron said. We worked for a long time on that Green Mountain thing mm -hmm. and it turned First, it was delayed by the feds, then it was delayed by consultants, then it was delayed by delay. <laughs> it's time for something like this to happen. Because uh, saving rate of the state is important. Um, so it sounds like we will be doing a little bit more work on this, getting kind of not ah. up. Uh, <laughs> Seems, Seems like, great. all right, sweet. <laughs> well, thank you. We'll be seeing you again uh, more this week and next. I imagine. Thank you so much for being able to kind of give us the, uh, <laughs> the quick version. <laughs> I really appreciate that. Um, we have just a ton on our plate right now. Uh, <laughs> With that, uh, we are going to switch gears back to uh, a different section of S17. Um, so, sorry about the policy whiplash, a totally different area of our jurisdiction here. Um, so, thank you uh, for everybody from the Treasurer's Office for joining us for that. We'll be uh, adding all back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would like to invite Director Sivret uh, and Christina, thank you very much for being with us today. And I think, um, so you had sent us a really great email that I want to just make sure the committee, um, that was that testimony posted? Um, I think so. I think it was, I just haven't had a chance to get yeah. those there. Go ahead. Great. Three documents. Been a little all over the place on my screen today. So great. Well, thank you, uh, Executive Director Severett. If you want to introduce yourself and, and the Ethics Commission work that you do to us, that would be really fantastic. And then we can talk about the, as a, the bill as it relates to your office. Sure. Yes. So I'm Christina Severett. I'm the Executive Director of the State Ethics Commission. And so I've been in that position for about a year and a half. Um, Ethics Commission has been in existence for about five years. Um, the big change for us is that last year, um, a state for ethics was passed by the General Assembly, signed by the governor, went into effect on July 1st, 2022. So it's relatively new. Um, and so we're in the process of raising awareness about the state code of ethics. Um, and we, at this point, it's time mostly provide services and so informative advice and guidance um, for state of Vermont employees and public servants. And so I think an important point to note here is that state of Vermont public servants does not 
include just state of Vermont employees, but also that includes other categories of public servants, such as board and commission members and volunteers. And so, and I believe my colleague uh, TJ Jones is also going to be joining us a little later, so I might as well give a brief introduction. So he's a consultant. He works for the commission for, for longer than I've been here. He's appeared before the House and Senate Government Operations Committee on numerous occasions, and he's the former state ethics prosecutor for Connecticut for 10 years. Um, he's currently a professor, um, but he, um, in his role as the state ethics prosecutor, went through issues related to sheriff reform in the state of Connecticut um, many years ago. And so he has um, also the ability to kind of give comparative examples if anyone has any questions about how things went in Connecticut. So apparently there are very similar issues and similar um, solutions. So hopefully he'll be joining us soon. <laughs> So I will admit that um, I have not been following this bill um, very closely. Uh, so I've tried to get myself up to speed in the last couple of days. Um, I don't know if anybody has any questions about the Ethics Commission, if I, if I went too fast there, if I missed anything. So uh, a couple of us were uh, on GovOps last year and we're here for the adoption of uh, the State Code of Ethics. And, um, but many of the members are new to the legislature or new to GovOps. So um, there might be questions, but I also just did want to um, preface your testimony with a little bit of an apology that the suggestion of having, instead of a separate conflict of interest, bringing sheriffs, the office of sheriff under the state code of ethics explicitly kind of came from uh, a, a bit of testimony and you referenced Senator White. Uh, I think it kind of started there and then other folks said, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. So that it's all one thing and we're not reinventing the wheel. Thought maybe we should have you in and ask for your feedback on that. So sorry to bring you in uh, <laughs> to this bill that you weren't <laughs> in part of the discussion of, but I think um, it, it may be a great opportunity. So interested to see how you feel about that. <laughs> no, no, and I'm glad you did. And I guess I should go back a little bit more to um, what, the, what the Ethics Commission does. So we provide ICE and advice and guidance and um, we can provide confidential advice you know over the phone over email and we also provide formal advisory opinions so those are for more complicated questions or questions that we think are going to come up repeatedly and so those are posted on our website and the full commission you know reads through those and approves those before those happen. We also have the ability to receive but not investigate complaints. So um, we can receive complaints from any source, not just state of Vermont public servants, but also members of the public. We review those complaints for sufficiency, and then the statute lays out um, different ways that we can refer the complaint on. For example, if it relates to criminal behavior, we refer it to the attorney general's office. Um, if it relates to a violation of um, THR policy and procedures manual, we refer it to um, the commissioner for human resources. So. Or that's an example of, of what we do. And so, yes, I'm glad you had me in because I do think that the, the idea that the state code of ethics, which was a long time in the making, it was very um, hotly debated and researched, and we think it is a good code of ethics. We do think that it should apply to pretty much all categories of public service in Vermont. We're looking for consistency, we're looking for parity, we're looking for like a clear understanding of the expectations around ethics. And so when this issue came up, it did raise a question in my mind as to whether the state code of ethics already covers some categories of sheriffs and deputy sheriffs. And I do believe that former Senator White also raised this issue. And so we did not have time to fully research the question and come up with an answer, but we do think that there is a pretty persuasive argument that at least in some situations, it does already cover um, some categories of sheriffs and some categories of deputy sheriffs, depending on who's paying them and what um, services they're providing and what the relationship is to the state. And so I think that's an important flag here because I did notice that there is previously um, a definition of conflict of interest that did not line up with the state code of ethics. And so I did, do you think if you're going to move forward with an alternative definition of conflicts of interest that was specific to sheriffs, you might inadvertently be setting up a parallel system um, where you have two standards that are in place that apply to not only you know public you know the same category of public official but you know somebody in the same position in the same profession and that's something that I think everyone can agree should be avoided and especially because I think the the alternative definition of conflict of interest that was proposed was a weaker definition of conflict of interest. And so the statute does allow the ability for um, agencies and different branches of government to institute higher standards, but not lower standards. And of course, this would be two different statutes, so we're not in the exact same situation. You know, you're not adopting this by policy. But at the same time, I think the intent in passing the State Code of Ethics was clear that you can create higher standards. The State Code of Ethics is supposed to be a baseline, so you shouldn't be going below that. Just to be clear, the, the sort of novel conflict of interest that was in S-17 as it passed the Senate is a weaker conflict of interest definition than the one that is in the state code. We believe so, yeah. 
Yeah. And I don't think the intent there was to look for a weaker definition of conflict of interest because you are looking for accountability. So, um, yeah, so our recommendation would be actually to, to look at the state of code of ethics and have it applied to all sheriffs and deputies. And I think this was also um, agreed upon by the Department of uh, the Department of Attorneys, State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. And so I did look through some of their prior testimony and they brought up some issues that they felt should be should be looked at or reconciled here. So one of those was, you know, outside employment, moonlighting work. So the state code of ethics does cover that situation. Um, there are rules in place and they proposed, or John Campbell at one point proposed that if a sheriff or deputy sheriff um, was interested in engaging in outside employment, then they would provide a detailed written statement uh, to the state auditor and the state ethics commission for consideration for any potential conflicts of interest. So bringing deputy sheriffs and sheriffs under the state code of ethics, you know, just positively um, saying that they are covered by that would give them the ability to request advice from the commission. Whereas I think right now would be unclear and not every sheriff and not every deputy sheriff would have that ability if they aren't considered to be covered by the state code of ethics. And that would give us the ability to give them an opinion um, if they requested one. And also I think uh, Director Campbell raised whistleblower protections, which is also included in the state code of ethics. So that would bring, you know, that would by covering sheriffs and deputy sheriffs and state code of ethics, they would cover a lot of other issues, not just conflict of interest. So I think there, there's, two, there's two ways you can move forward here. I think one would be to research whether state code of ethics already covers some categories of sheriffs and deputy sheriffs, or you could say the preferred path forward is just to say that yes, it does, and include that in your language here. Um, and so when we're talking about conflict of interest, I think one thing that we had flagged was that um, there's nothing in the, the bill as it is regarded that relates to financial disclosure requirements that are closely related to conflict of interest. And so right now, candidates for legislature, statewide office, um, and also executive officers have you know, financial disclosure forms that either, either have to follow when they're running for office or in the case of executive officer financial disclosures, um, they have to file those annually. And so we do think that we strongly feel that that's something worth considering. And there is language in the Senate at the moment related to implementing penalties for candidates who fail to file their financial disclosures, as well as executive officers. So there is language related to financial disclosures being considered um, at this moment. And due to its close tie in with conflicts of interest, we do think that would be something to consider when it comes to sheriffs and deputy sheriffs, if you want to give the public the ability to identify financial conflicts for themselves. So, um, and I did submit, I think it's a 50 state chart along with the testimony that we developed for different purposes. Um, however, it does give you an overview and gives you um, a sense that there is precedent for having uh, county elected officials file disclosures. So this wouldn't be a novel idea. I think there are two ways that you could have someone file a financial disclosure. So one would be as a candidate. And then also you can consider if you are looking for an annual financial disclosure requirement, they could always file them with the ethics commission along with executive officers. I think there's a pretty small number of sheriffs 14, if I am correct. And so we could handle filing at our end and the posting of that information, if that's something you plan to consider. And that the annual disclosures for executive officers, mm -hmm. about how many of those are the state? Um, approximately 80 something. Yeah. And I think that would be if you're interested in an annual financial disclosure, which I think is the preferred, but then also as a candidate, um, I think they're related, the executive officer annual filing disclosure requirements are related to the candidate filing disclosure requirements in the sense that you are identifying conflicts of interest, but the public can use them for different purposes, right? So you're looking at the entire candidate. When you're looking at a candidate financial disclosure, you're saying like, who's this person? Where do their allegiances lie? And so they're used in similar ways, but also slightly different ways in the sense of like, what is the person who's reading the form trying to evaluate here? And they're also useful for the person who's filing the form, because often if you're new to government service, that is your first, um, I guess, experience with ethics, and it helps the person identify conflicts of interest for themselves as they're like, as they're um, breaking down their own financial interests. So, and I will say that the financial disclosure form that candidates and um, candidates and executive officers have to file is the same form. I included a copy of it in my testimony. It is very modest compared to other states. And so you may want to consider um, changing the form if you wanted to go with that as a model to address you know, the specific issues you're looking at when it comes to sheriffs. All right, uh, so I guess I should move on to the specific comments about the language unless you have any questions. 
So uh, I wanted to invite the committee, especially since there are folks who didn't uh, weren't around here for the last couple of years while we were doing uh, the state code of ethics and, and talking about some of these issues in detail and how they have applied to various officers. And there's um, we could we can and should do uh, a much deeper dive into that work to bring this committee up to speed. Um, and I think that there's a lot of interest uh, in the public and I'll acknowledge that there have been some stories about how accessible our and how thorough our uh, legislative and executive financial disclosures are. Um, and so I think that this is a topic that we're gonna be returning to in a broader sense in the future. Uh, but are there any kind of general questions? Um, one thing that I thought might be useful for some folks uh, is that you mentioned uh, that there are certain types of complex questions that people ask you for advice. So I thought a couple of examples of where people kind of go to the ethics commission and go, am I okay here? Or is this, or am I violating policy? If you might share a couple of those, like give folks who are new to this a sense of sort of what are the questions that people have that are thorny in this area? Sure, and so we do have one advisory opinion that's been posted. Um, so we're working on a couple of others, but it's related to um, questions that have come up here and related to outside employment. So if I were to engage in outside employment, I'm a state employee, um, you know, this is my proposal. This is what I plan on doing. Is this incompatible with my state of Vermont, you know, position? And so then going into a detailed analysis of, you know, could you, because when you're looking at outside employment, it just, it brings in misuse of position, misuse of resources, preferential treatment, conflict of interest. And so you kind of go through an analysis under the state code of ethics, any issues that might arise in your outside employment. And then we would say, you know, you're clear here. You're not clear here. If you take this course of action, be clear. If you take this course, another course of action, you could be opening yourself up to a complaint and that's the type of advice that we provide so questions about outside employment um, misuse of position um, preferential treatment and conflicts of interest are generally the questions that we get within our office any general questions for director Sivert before we dive into recommendations it's going to be a big week here <laughs> so if you think of anything <laughs> all right go ahead yeah. please go ahead I apologize. I know that I speak quickly, so I try and put my thoughts down. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes. Yes. So um, I, I won't read through. I think the entire the statutory language. I'll just give you my comments on the language. Um, so we did make the suggestion that when you are talking. You include in the definition of conflict of interest that the ethics commission suggests the underlined language, which you can you know find here. And it looks like. The underlining didn't come out, but we suggest you add um, a sentence that says sheriffs and deputy sheriffs are considered public servants for the purposes of um, 3 BSA uh, section 1202 1, which just makes it clear that sheriffs do fall under the code of ethics and so that everything in the code of ethics applies to sheriffs and deputy sheriffs. Um, we also um, noted that there is kind of an addition to the definition of conflict of interest. Um, even though you, you're falling back on the state code of ethics as your baseline, there's an addition in the sense that you're bringing in, I think, um, outside organizations um, into the mix. And so we just suggest changing some of the wording here just to make it in line with what is already in the state code of ethics. So those are pretty minor changes. Um, adding the word also just to highlight that this is, you know, a slightly different but um, higher requirement. Um, and we also would suggest that since you're bringing in, you know, organizations of which the sheriff or deputy sheriff is affiliated, um, just be further defined for clarity. And so we do think that this would relate to a financial disclosure requirement um, in the sense that you could require um, the sheriff or deputy sheriff to um, disclose those organizations of which they're affiliated on their financial disclosure form. And then that's going to be very clear when you're, going to, when you're discussing conflicts of interest, exactly what those organizations are. Right. And so moving on, it does look like a higher standard is being created um, in this bill when it comes to recusal for conflict of interest. So if you look at the state code of ethics, we do have scenarios because it is a is a broader definition of conflict of interest that brings in you know, more situations. So we look at scenarios where somebody might be able to move forward, even though they have a conflict of interest or the appearance of a conflict of interest. And that can be when an action is purely administrative. It's a de minimis action um, where there's no one else who could literally do it. Um, and so we have a procedure that's set out in the code of ethics where if that is the case, then you file a disclosure form that says, I recognize that there's an appearance of a conflict of interest or um, appearance or an actual 
conflict of interest, but I believe I can be impartial and move forward. And that's something that's going to be available to members of the public to see. That's not explicit in the state code of ethics, but you're supposed to write the disclosure in a way that a member of the public can understand it. So that is implied. Um, and so it looks like here you're taking away that option. Um, which is, you know, perfectly acceptable. But I would just make clarifying language here that says, you know, once you identified a conflict of interest, you must recuse yourself. That's how I read this. So I would clarify that that is a departure from the state court of ethics that's creating a higher standard. Um, and, you know, of course, that can be reconsidered in light of the state code of ethics having, you know, a broader definition of conflict of interest that may bring in more scenarios that you're not you're not thinking about here. So, and you're referring specifically to. Um Section four, which is three fourteen B, sheriff and deputy sheriffs will avoid any conflict of interest or appearance, and then it's directing them they have to recuse themselves from the matter and take no further action. So it's yes. And so this is a stricter standard. So generally speaking. Um, under the state code of ethics, you have the option of moving forward, but you need to file a disclosure form saying you've identified a conflict of interest or the appearance of conflict of interest, but you think there's good cause why, as to why you can move forward. So say, for example, um, you're in charge of you know, assigning cases to someone and it is solely based on you know, alphabetical order. Somebody you know, a close friend of yours comes in and you are only like going by, by alphabetical order as to who you assign that case to. You're not choosing somebody who think will give your friend a more favorable result. There's no possible way that you can deviate from what is in front of you. And you're the only person in your office that could actually do this. You can say, oh, okay, I recognize that someone could say that I'm assigning, you know, this case to, you know, investigator or someone um, who's going to act more favorably for my friend. People know this is my friend. However, you know, I'm only there's policy, this procedure is in place. I cannot deviate from it. There's no one else to do this. So therefore I recognize this could be perceived as a conflict of interest. I'm going to file a conflict of interest form. And then if somebody wants to see it, then they'll know that I have acknowledged this and that, you know, there's, we've set a court of a course of action in place to make sure that, you know, a conflict of interest, the perception of conflict of interest exists. However, in reality, in engaging in these duties, I am not giving someone preferential treatment. So that would be an example of where you would do that. And so this does appear to take away that option, which is, you know, perfectly acceptable. It just is a deviation from the state code of ethics. So, um, okay, uh, next section would be um, related to filing complaints um, with the state code, with the state ethics commission. And so currently um, our feeling is, is that you can bring sheriffs and deputy sheriffs in under the state code of ethics, and that is what the above comments related to. And that would give them the ability to ask for advice and uh, guidance from us. However, we still would not have the ability to accept complaints from any source. So the state code of ethics or, um, sorry, 3BSA uh, section 1223 would need to be amended because at this point in time, um, it says the state code of ethics can accept, can accept complaints um, related to three branches of government. So you do think that you need clarifying language that says would include sheriffs in that mix. Um, and then that would give, you know, that make the ethics commission, you know, fully encompass and fully have jurisdiction over sheriffs and deputy sheriffs and to the same extent that it already does with other state public servants. Um, so let me see. Yes, and I think that the big, the big question in the room is that we do have the ability to receive complaints, but we do not have independent investigatory or enforcement powers. And so we would need a place to refer uh, complaints to. And so, as I mentioned, you know, for example, if it alleged criminal behavior, we would be referring it to the attorney general's office or a state's attorney's office. Um, if it's more, you know, routine, like a policy violation, somebody is alleging misuse of funds, we would need um, we, we would need to specify where we'd be referring those complaints to. I will say as a preview for next year, we will be asking for investigatory and enforcement powers for the ethics commission. So it is conceivable that the ethics commission could in the near future become the right place to handle certain types of investigations, certainly, um, because we do feel like we should take a, Vermont should take a holistic approach to ethics and not a piecemeal approach. Like just, you know, looking at sheriffs through this process, looking through, you know, somebody who works for, you know, the agency of transportation, another process, we do think there should be one independent agency that's looking into all of these and it should be independ done independently. So, but at this moment in time, we do not have a path for that. So that would also need to be addressed. And I think the last comment was um, the definition of confidential information. And we just suggested, you know, changing that to be in line with the code of ethics. I think there's just a couple of language, language changes, changes there that were minor. 
Great. The, um, this memo, I just want to say, is really, really useful with clear and specific suggestions for how we could uh, improve the language. Um, so I very much appreciate that. Um, do you folks have any questions for Director Sibrid about what we've heard so far? I don't have a question for her. Just for us generally, as it relates to this ethic, these yeah. ethics recommendations. Yeah, go ahead. I'm just wondering why we didn't align with the state's definition. So the bill that came over to backing up to the general context of how uh, we, we got involved with the Ethics Commission in this bill. Uh, so you'll recall that when S-17 came over to us from the Senate, it developed a whole new conflict of interest policy. And we heard um, several folks in testimony a week or two ago uh, basically say, why don't you just hold sheriffs in under the State Ethics Commission? And everybody kind of went, Oh, okay, and I kind of got the nods from the committee. So in the subsequent draft here, I went ahead and dropped uh, language uh, with the support from legislative council to try to get at that. Um, and uh, it's pretty clear that we, in our, our attempt to make the Senate bill and uh, this bill be not reinvent the wheel, that we actually did deviate a little bit. So we were heading in that direction with the subsequent draft, but the original Senate has passed. It's like a, a completely novel, different conflict of interest policy. Um, and it seemed like most of our witnesses were like, hmm, that really might not make the most sense. We might want to just use the ones we're all agreed on. And I think the the other benefit of that, and, the, and Director Silver can feel free to disagree with me because you're the expert, but then as we update the code, sheriffs get pulled along as being covered by that code, as opposed to having a completely separate thing stuck that we would have to change the law again in order to sort of capture any new, you know, authority or application of the state code, so. Correct. And I'll also flag that there's language um, the Senate now regarding municipal ethics and the possibility that the Ethics Commission will be coming forward with a proposal next year on how to address municipal ethics um, on the state level. And presumably in the proposal, there would be a complaint process, a proposal for complaint process. And so I'm just bringing that here because it could be you know, quite possible that next year there'd be more than one option on how to work with the complaint process when it comes to you. Um, both municipal, municipal officials, which could include county officials in that, or, or on a state level with the state ethics commission. So, but yes, I fully like agree that that is the advantage of you know having everything under in one place. Is that one that gets updated, the updates apply to everyone. And I do think that Senator. Sorry, All right, thank you. Um, so, other than this bill, which would spell out sheriffs. Are there other statutes that spell out particular elected officials for having to follow the state ethics code? Um, in addition to, this would be the first case of going outside of state employment. And so I think the case for bringing this in is number one, just having, I think Vermont is moving, for, moving forward in a path that is looking to address ethics holistically within the state. But um, yeah, to bring up the point that, you know, former Senator Jeanette White raised, there is a strong argument that some sheriffs and deputy sheriffs could already be considered state of Vermont employees under the state code of ethics definition of public servant. So there is already some overlap there. I personally feel there's a strong case that there is. And so this would kind of be a way to ameliorate um, what could potentially become a messy situation when you're discussing what standards apply to who the sheriff, yes, this other sheriff, no, it could get quite complicated. I guess my question was other types of elected positions. Well, anyone who's an elected an elected position within the state, so legislate all legislators, for example, statewide elected officials. So yes, when you talk about municipal municipal elected officials, no. When you talk about county officials, no. And so the argument I think for bringing in sheriffs under the code fully would be because there is an argument. Well, number one, just for you know parity, but the argument that some of them are already covered by it, and that is something that would require some research to determine you know where people landed. I do think there's a strong argument for it because it does seem like. Some sheriffs and deputy sheriffs are paid, both paid by, paid by the state while they are engaged in duties for the state. So that would make sense to me. But like if other, I know we have very few county officials in the state of Vermont, um, but other county officials are not spelled out as having to follow the same code of ethics. Judges, yes. They are. Okay. I guess. I'm and I think the only category left would be high bailiffs. Okay. So they would be the ones that would be left out. 
Yeah, I guess the question would be like the assistant judges, for instance, who are county uh, officials and they're, you know, set out in the constitution. Are they covered right now? That, that's yeah. ambiguous, probably in the same way that it is with sheriffs. I would say last year when the discussion came up that they were they were discussed, and my understanding is that they they would as employees of the as as, as members of the judicial branch by C. Terry Corson's here. So maybe she would want to weigh in. But yes, it, I would say yes. And we'll note that, that I believe TJ is here too, and so I think he could also like weigh in because he was involved in those conversations as well last year. He maybe he has. Some additional recollections. <laughs> but also weigh in. Uh, before we go to TJ, I might, if, if Terry Willing, do you want to weigh in on, on that while we're on this particular question? I'm Terry Purcell, State Court University. I was involved in those negotiations, I guess, in a different capacity. But um, um, there is a judicial code of ethics that does apply to assistant judges. And I believe that it, it, there was a, a Acknowledgement that the state code of ethics would apply to the extent that there wasn't an inconsistency between the judicial code of ethics and the state code of ethics. And if so, that's my I remember us going around and around and around trying to make it so that we weren't sort of undermining the existing judicial code of ethics. And now that you you bring that up, it sparks my memory from when we were talking about this two years ago. Uh, so yes. Uh, that, that sounds like we, we tried to, to square the two um, codes, the state code and the state code. And that, sorry, that judicial code applies to assistant judges? Sounds like all judges, right? Judicial code that doesn't Just assistant judges. Oh, not just all. assistant judges. No, all 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 judicial judges. including all judicial officers. Yeah. Yes, yeah, that's correct, as does the state code of ethics. And so therefore that would go back to the, you know, the original discussion about creating a higher standard versus stating, creating a lower standard. So when the lower, when there's a lower standard in place and the state code of ethics creates a higher standard, the higher standard applies. If there's a policy or rule in place that requires a higher standard, then that standard is going to apply. So you're always looking at what is the higher standard of ethical behavior. And so, you know, it depends on the, it's a fact-based <laughs> in this situation, but yes. Clear as mud. Thank you. Well, so uh, we're, we'll do more work, I imagine, on ethics, uh, and as uh, the executive director said. But the idea is that the state code of ethics can apply broadly and is essentially um, it has standards, and then there there are professional standards like the judicial standards that apply to judges that can oftentimes be more stringent, and the the law, as I'm hearing both Terry and Executive Director Sivrit explain it, is just that in the situation, depending on the person's position and the facts, the more stringent code applies, whatever, whichever one in that situation or the pieces covering it. Okay, so I understand that. I just don't understand the um, who is covered by the state code of ethics in the county. So it'd be judges. Uh, we think there's an argument that some categories of sheriffs and deputy sheriffs are already covered. Some of them would not be if they are paid by the for, for by the county and they're not you know performing work for the state. Then that would be a separate category. So at the moment we would say judges, some some sheriffs, some deputy sheriffs, but not all of them and not high bailiffs. So I'd like to welcome TJ, who's with us via Zoom. Thanks for being with us. You're welcome. I thought he was a singer. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you get that a lot? <laughs> Never. Uh, well, um, thanks for being with us and, and offering your perspective uh, on uh, S17 and this application of uh, share, uh, the state code of ethics to sheriffs potentially. Sure, sure. And I'm happy to provide any information the committee wants. I, I anticipated the, the committee would want to hear um, whether and how much uh, the sheriffs were brought up during the initial discussions on the code of ethics. And my best recollection is that really they, they were not the focus. And I don't recall 
uh, them or any county employees um, coming up in the conversation. But I'm, I'm also here if the, the committee wants, uh, Connecticut has a uh, unique trajectory with respect to ethics and uh, sheriffs. And I'm also happy to share uh, that and my experience with that. That'd be great. And if you could, I'm sorry, uh, I got ahead of myself and should have asked you to introduce yourself in your, in your role with the Ethics Commission for the record. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, my name's Thomas Jones. Um, people usually call me TJ. I'm a uh, professor at the University of Connecticut, but I also consult on ethics issues with uh, local state, uh, local and state governments and also corporations. Um, and I'm here on behalf of the commission. I've had an on and off relationship with the commission since um, they began the pursuit uh, of filling in the office uh, right after the original bill was passed. Um, so I, I do have uh, somewhat of a off and on history with the commission. I guess I'm the institutional knowledge. <laughs> yes, you guys are that <laughs> Um, well, I uh, am definitely interested in, in both of the, the two pieces that you brought up, and I think the committee would be interested to hear um, how the sheriffs kind of fit in. We're, I think, on many aspects of our exploration of the Office of Sheriff, we found that, uh, they, that their role uh, hasn't been completely defined in the Constitution and has sort of just evolved on its own over time as we've asked them to do and perform different functions. Um, and so I'm, it, it would be great to understand it if they were considered at all in the original founding, but and how unusual or usual it is to sort of bring them up into the state code of ethics um, for our neighboring states. Sure, and, and I can speak to that. Um, Vermont's unique in a lot of ways, but one way that they are, that the state is not unique is that most states have constitutional provisions relating to sheriffs. And that has to do with the long, long history, particularly of, of New England states and law enforcement, because at the inception of the New England states, there really wasn't any law enforcement other than a sheriff, which is a, um, a vestige of the old um, English system going back a thousand years. So sheriffs have been here from the beginning for all New England states, and they are, except with, I think, the case of Rhode Island, they're all hard baked into the constitutions. But the problems that arise uh, or are arising in Vermont are not unique either, in that each of the states, particularly in New England, has had issues grappling with how to um, bring accountability to um, sheriffs, particularly because in, in most of New England, there is no um, meaningful county government anymore. Uh, and so there's saddled with this vestige of the past um, and trying to figure out how that incorporates into the new uh, state society. In the situation of Connecticut, Connecticut is unique in, in that it's the only state among the 50 that had by constitutional amendment uh, done away with sheriffs. Um, and they did this in the year 2000. Now, the reason that they did away with sheriffs and they had to do it by constitutional amendment was this issue of accountability. And the catalyzing issues were threefold. The first was that uh, the sheriffs were fee splitting. Um, fees were set by the state and the sheriffs would deputize their deputies, but then uh, charge the deputies a certain fee for every time the uh, deputy affected, say, service. Um, so this was largely deemed a kickback that the state was not very happy about. Um, the second issue was the uh, cross um, hiring of uh, relatives, this sort of cross nepotism where the high sheriff in one county would hire the son of the high sheriff of another county, and in exchange, that high sheriff would hire some relative of the other. And this was uh, obviously frowned on by the state. 
The final was uh, the, the big issue that led to the constitutional amendment was um, all the sheriffs were um, members of the state's sheriff association. And the sheriff association was run by a sheriff um, by design. And the sheriff who runs the sheriff association uh, was able to have a lot of perks, including club membership, free mileage, uh, housing. Um, and what came to pass is the head uh, sheriff of the sheriff's association um, began making it a requirement um, in order to be deputized that uh, deputies become members of the association for uh, quite a bit of money. And that money was used to pay for the high sheriff's position at the sheriff's association, which was loaded with perks. And the high sheriff at the time ended up going to prison um, because of that. And that, of course, led to uh, all kinds of concern around the state and ultimately the, um, the constitutional amendment. In the journey to the constitutional amendment, the state put the sheriffs under the code of ethics for the state. And putting them under the code of ethics was one of the things that hastened the demise of sheriffs because all of a sudden, there was accountability on the sheriffs um, and investigations opened up, complaints were made. Um, and as I say, that became newsworthy and uh, hastened the demise of that constitutional provision. So uh, I just wanted to say that uh, I doubt that the director of the Sheriff's Association in Vermont is experiencing uh, the same things, but, you know, uh, we, we may, he's sitting in the room here, uh, TJ, so I just uh, wanted to acknowledge that, that uh, maybe the experience in Vermont here as it is so often is a little different than it was in Connecticut. Absolutely. <laughs> Um, but it sounds like the the bringing the sheriffs up under the state code of ethics did you know provide an, a layer of accountability um, that wasn't there before, and that uh, so you'd largely be supportive of the effort that we're making here to yes have the sheriffs covered. And from a drafting perspective, the way that Connecticut did that was they just added the sheriffs to the. Um, uh, the then Ethics Commission's governing statute. If you're familiar with Connecticut, the existing ethics office now is, is new as of 2005, um, when the old uh, commission was disbanded um, for a variety of reasons. Yeah. And sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I might add to, um, I, as TJ mentioned, he said that it brought out a lot of issues once they were put under the state code of ethics. So one, one element that I didn't mention is there was a training requirement under the state code of ethics to be trained in the state code of ethics. And so, and then the ethics commission would then become a resource for sheriffs if they needed advice and advice or guidance. And so right now we have an online training that's available, but you can always request in-person trainings from us on specific topics. So we'd always be happy to set up, you know, a meeting with the sheriffs online in person to read expectations under the state code of ethics to ensure that, you know, Behaviors that might get you in trouble, you know, you might not, you know, be clear to you, but we can help, we can help clear the way and make sure that there's a consistent understanding of the type of behavior that is expected of the state code of ethics. And elsewhere in the bill, we're contemplating having um, sort of a supportive staff member um, in the current draft. It's the deputy director. Uh, we, I had received uh, some suggestion today that it potentially be a director of operations. Uh, but regardless of what we call that new staff person that we're considering, sounds like maybe this would be uh, another thing for them to facilitate. We've specified in there that one of the things that they would do would be to uh, assist in uh, complying with a model policy around financial uh, compensation benefits, financial management of the office. Um, so it sounds like ethics could be uh, another addition to what they can support the sheriffs in having consistent compliance and training. Yeah. So under the state code of ethics, there are only, I think, four approved training providers. So unfortunately, unless they're approved training provider, they could not do that. And that is to encourage consistency and the understanding of the state code of ethics. But we would always be happy to provide any training or consider other options for, you know, approving other training providers as well. Okay. That is a good, great point. Cool. So I won't get too far out over my skis with trying to uh, 
make that new position have to be an ethics expert? Yeah. I think there's all, I mean, just when it comes to the actual state code of ethics itself, you know, so that is the specific, that's a specific requirement there, but clearly there are a lot of other issues that, you know, will come up that are not related specifically to the state code of ethics. Is there anything else that you or TJ would like us to know before we, uh, no, I think that, um, you know, I think that the two things that kind of stood out for me were definitely the fact that, you know, some sheriff's deputies can already be covered under the state code of ethics. And I think that is a strong argument um, for bringing them in, you know, completely and not, you know, adopting separate definition of conflict of interest. And also, I think it sounds like maybe the financial disclosure requirements have not previously maybe been thought of or discussed. Um, and so we do think that, that would be an important element to address within the conflicts of interest section, whether the language is addressed here or elsewhere. But I think that that is, you know, that is something that's important and in line with what other states do when we're talking about county elected officials. Well, thank you very much, uh, TJ, and thank you, Executive Director Sivert, for uh, joining us today. That was really helpful in uh, confirming that we weren't going on a crazy track with trying to bring the sheriffs up under the state code. And um, I really appreciate the, the suggestions. We'll try to work with legislative council um, and you offline if we have questions about incorporating some of those recommendations, but the memo is really helpful for us to get those in. All right. Always available if you have further questions. So thank, thank you. you very, very much for being with us. Thank you. All right. Um, so committee, we are going to be um, picking our work back up on this tomorrow morning. Um, I am um, wondering if there's any uh, hesitation about me including some of the recommendations from the memo in the upcoming draft and um, I had talked during our previous break uh, both with um, BSEA folks and with Terry and others about uh, adding explicitly the Sheriff's Association BSEA to that reporting uh, requirement or the report back in 7A it seemed like there was consensus around that but um, from what we've heard today, it sounds like on both of these, we're kind of on the right track with a few additional tweaks, but just wanted the committee have an opportunity to flag any issues if there are any. Yeah, Representative Hango, please. Thank you. I'm still trying to, I guess my notes were on the previous draft, so it's really hard to kind of follow the, follow the map here. Um, so I had some notes about the transport of juveniles needing to hear from DCF if that if this is the appropriate place or if we need to put some other provisions in because it's transport transportation of juveniles. I think that's section 5D. Um, the other thing that I wanted to hear from is the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs um, on this new position that we're creating. And specifically, I'm concerned that the position is going to be funded according to what we have written in this bill um, by a charge assessed to the Sheriff's Department. And we've heard that they're struggling financially. Um, so I don't know what kind of funding method um, we could go forward with, but I think Rep Chase had asked me last week, well, what was I envisioning? And, and I said, well, if the state, I, I would prefer it being a state budget, but <clears throat> if it had to be the departments of, of the, sh the sheriff departments, it should be proportional um, to what they're bringing in in terms of, I don't know, I would while we're on that, um, the department was uh, going to come in today and they had a, a, a conflict that they okay. couldn't come in and testify. So I did have that one down. Okay. Uh, and in, and I, in light of them not being able to be here, I emailed John and Annie mm -hmm. and I said, um, you know, there's uh, you know, been some talk about this. I had said online, you know, we probably need to uh, fix that section and figure out where this money's really going to come from and how. Um, I'd like to ask them about uh, it. There was in part of the negotiations um, from a previous 
contract, there was an exempt position created that isn't filled right now. It sounds like I just found this out in emails from them because I had some questions for them and I was hoping to ask on the record. And so it sounds like there may be a position that's not completely defined yet, but that's already been approved uh, in their office that could become this new either deputy director or director of operations. Um, so uh, when we have them in, whether it's tomorrow or we extend this into Thursday, um, I think that that may solve the problem if that really is a viable path. And then we can get rid of the five C B charge assessed and just say, you know, it's going to be this position that's already been approved, but it's going to have this title and it's going to do this work. Um, that may help resolve that, that question. So I've been behind the scenes trying to find that path was hoping we could hear from the department today, but um, just the timing didn't work out. So we'll get them back in on that. Um, on the, the juvenile uh, transport, I had, I apologize. I had kind of uh, kind of forgotten about that one, um, but that's we're really talking about juvenile. Yeah, juveniles. And let me. Um, I mean, it's just so specifically spelled out that I think we need to address that because we're not really qualified to talk about anything in the DCF purview, in my opinion. Yeah, I think that that language uh, is definitely not something um, that came from any legislator. It was a uh, recommendation, I think, that came in that memo from the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs, but I'm going to try and find a reference for that. So that would be good to have them speak on that as well. And um, the section on the audits, it doesn't appear in this draft, but there also are, I don't know, there's a heading that says audits, but then it doesn't say anything. It says section two is amended to read, and then it just goes into the county sheriff's department. So I'm not sure where audits went. And that might be a question for Tim. That's on page one at the bottom. Page two now, bottom of page two. Yeah, it's just, yeah. Am I on the wrong draft? Sorry. Yeah, we're looking at a 2.2 2. Yeah. at bottom of page two. Is, yeah, I'm yeah, on page on top, one. Then on the top, top of page three. I'm on the top of page, uh, bottom of page one. Go, uh, go right there. That's yeah, right. yeah. I think I, I think you're in the right spot. So this audit at the bottom of page one, oh, and then it goes yeah, into yeah, section yeah. two, okay. yeah. which doesn't appear to have anything to do with audits. Yeah. It does. Would you, would you mind uh, helping us out here? Because I think this very much does have to do with audits, but I don't want to have to explain it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. Uh, for the record, Tim Dunn, Legislative Council. Um, so there are two okay. sections that were in audits uh, in sections two and three of the bill. Okay. So, um, so I was looking at section two. And section two has modified. This is um, what I was speaking to this morning about, um, which is kind of a general rewrite of the uh, audits, the language pertaining to audits in the transitionary period. Okay. Um, between sheriffs or when a sheriff announces them, okay, be leaving office and walk. Yep, I can I can read that so that's like that. Way. That's really fine. Sense. Then the section three audits are um, what triggers an annual audit. Is that what that one is? Let's see. No, this is the no. establishment of any special. Um, groups that the sheriff or their employees will. So that's the, the uh, not number nine? Uh, yes, yep. So really important, um, and I think we, uh, Representative Merwicki had brought up a question about uh, 10C, and I had asked the auditor about this, and I think that Deputy Auditor Ash sent us an email. Give us 
that I can forward. He sent me an email today, actually at 9.32 a.m. I'm seeing um, to try to answer a question about this, which uh, I, I think was meant to be forwarded to the committee and I just didn't get around to it. I apologize. Things are moving fast around. Um, yeah, I mean, when when it, I understand what, what this is trying to get at, I just don't know how it's getting there because it says the auditor shall charge for any associated costs in the same manner described in 32 BSA 168B, which doesn't tell me a lot until I look it up. Tim, could you um, maybe, my understanding is that this um, section is just Basically, if the auditor can charge the sheriffs for the audits. Um, and then to the email that I just forwarded from Deputy Auditor Ash that he sent um, this morning, it looks like the, the question was that Representative Merwicki had asked that I think was really on point was, are we setting up a situation by giving this flexibility about audits where there's still going to be lots and lots of charges that, that sheriff's departments can't afford? Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, what the, the this language attempts to do is actually the reverse of that by giving the auditor some more flexibility and for them to not have to perform the full um, full audit that they do every other year if if they've just performed it that they could do something that was more cursory and so uh what deputy De uh, auditor ash said was that the full audits that they do every other year um that their contract is uh six thousand three hundred and fifty dollars um and that so if they had to do you know a full audit again they would be doing that charge back sixty three hundred dollars he gave me the example when I asked him about this. Um, I don't think he references this in this uh, e informational email that he sent us, but we can have him back if you want to talk to him. I think that the um, the example he gave was that there was basically uh, it was less than a thousand dollars that in staff time to do the review that led to the recommendations around the Caledonia bonus issue, um, and you know that that they didn't. It's the can, they actually don't use their authority and charge back in those cases. So sort of worst case scenario, if they feel like they have to exercise this discretion, they're talking about a $6,300 audit charge. And I believe Sheriff Anderson might have a, a different interpretation of this, but. Uh, I think we're actually, uh, for the record, Mark Anderson of uh, Montreal Association, I think we're okay with the auditor's uh, language as written, we've raised a concern that this is the, the opportunity an auditor to come in and say, we're going to assign a CPA for the next year to watch you because we just don't trust you. And as written, we're required to pay that cost. It's not to suggest that our current auditor is doing that or is going to do that. It's just we saw it as a bit of an open door. So that's, that was what we raised, but we're okay with the auditor's language, noting that if that happened, we're going to be coming here to ask for a brief. Does that satisfy your concern, Representative Hango? Oh, I think so. I really don't, because I couldn't reference the same line because the bill drafts are now changed and the line numbers are different. I'm not really sure where I was going with my notes from last Friday, unfortunately. And no, no, we're but, yeah, I think we, all, exactly. we all kind of saw this and we're saying, wait a minute, what are we doing here? Are we opening up every sheriff to these really expensive audits? So that, and Representative Rowicki had some really pointed questions and I, think that the combination of that reassurance from uh, Sheriff Anderson and, and this piece are, uh, okay. does it for me. Um, yes. Uh, Annie may be able to help us uh, with that previous question about juvenile transport. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Hi, thank Annie. you, Tim. <laughs> really appreciate that. Uh, Annie, can you hear us? Uh, I can. Thank you, uh, committee, uh, Mr. Chair. And thank you, committee members. I heard. I just clicked on a bit ago, and I heard two of your. I heard two of the questions that were being asked. Uh, Representative Hango asked about um, the position, um, uh, which would be it's like, like a director of operations. It is correct. We do have a position available that is uh, in the budget currently, not filled. 
Uh, it was originally uh, held out when the uh, bargaining unit was formed, and it was originally contemplated as a, a, a transportation oversight manager. But realistically, this the needs of the sheriff have grown since we originally co contemplated what that position would look like. A director of operations could, in fact, do many of the things that you're talking about, which would be assist with policy and making sure the sheriffs are all following similar financial obligations, all of the things that the, you know, getting them the ethics training, setting those things up, overseeing how transports are going. Um, and it would not require an assessment to the sheriff's offices. We have the money in the budget for a position. And I think we would be able to, um, to use that position. It's vacant right now. We would be able to fill that and it's, it's already budgeted. So I think that that would alleviate, alleviate any issue of how would you assess to each sheriff's department, the small ones versus the large ones. So I think we could absolutely do that. Um, and I could stop and take a question if anybody has any on that. Great, thank you. So there's an existing exempt position. We could rename it the director of operations from the deputy director that's labeled in this bill. It'll help us establish some of those functions and, and it's money that's already budgeted, but there isn't a person that's doing that transport oversight role today. Correct, correct. You know, sometimes uh, it's just things kind of fall together and I really appreciate your office yeah. making that happen, Annie. Yeah. <laughs> we can do that. Um, the, the other question that was asked about was why was that language on juveniles added? And, the, and realistically it was for clarity because right now we do, the state, um, um, the state transport deputies do transport juveniles who are brought in for court. Sometimes the judge might, for example, send them to Brattleboro Retreat or to some other program or they, um, generally speaking, that's where the transports go. But, um, and there is a section of the statute that refer to the transportation of, um, I think it said prisoners, persons with um, um, mental health issues, and it didn't reference juveniles. So there was a, there, it was confusing in the statute that one section of the statute actually acknowledged the sheriff's work with the court transports for juveniles, but it wasn't in both places. So we were just trying to be clear that the court ordered transports of juveniles. Um, and I, maybe Sheriff Anderson um, um, could speak on this, but we were just, we saw it in one section of the statute. It wasn't in both sections of the statute. We were just trying to be consistent. So, um, and I do know that DCF has uh, contracts with sheriffs for other types of work with juveniles and maybe even other type, types of transports. And maybe Sheriff Anderson could comment on that. But I don't think it's, I don't think it's been, it wasn't critical, Representative Hango. We were just looking at two sections of the statute that didn't line up. And I think there might have been a third question on audits that I missed when I was trying to click into this. I think we cleared that one up. Yeah, I think we did okay. clear that one up. Uh, Thank you. Th this You're brief welcome. testimony has helped enormously inform uh, what I hope will be the ultimate or penultimate draft. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I really appreciate you coming so in. I, I did have one other, if I could ask a question, and maybe it is regard to the um, piece on the ethics. So the, um, the state deputies um, who are covered under the bargaining unit and their state employees, the, tw the 24 state deputies, um, and I understand that the, that the proposal is to add them to the financial disclosures on the ethics piece, but they would, that would put them in a, a unique position as realistically state employees who are not elected, not appointed, high level appointees, not exempt employees, such as people like me and John, um, where they'd be like, like pay grade 21 employees um, who are being asked to disclose financially and other state employees don't have to do that. So I just throw that out there as a question for the co committee to consider. I think what we were, what the committee was originally looking at was the question as to whether or not they could solicit this really came as a result of that Addison County situation where you had the sheriff that was soliciting funds to pay for the same thing that the sheriff should be doing with state and county funds. And I just threw that out there because as I was listening, I was thinking, I'm not sure that, that as state employees at that level, 
they'd be the only ones being required to make financial disclosures. Yeah, so Executive Director Sivert had talked a bit about um, the, the idea of adding a financial disclosure. The committee hasn't done that yet, and we haven't looked at a draft that, that contemplates that yet. So um, if we do, I'm hearing from you that, that should the financial disclosure should only apply to the elected, not the, the deputy sheriffs. Or at least to consider that it would be it would be outside the norm of we don't make other state employees provide financial disclosures, particularly what I kind of would call, you know, the working the working class of state government, sort of the, the people that are, you know, not at the high levels of, you know, their their regular kind of regular Joe state employees. Okay. Thank you. Hi. Thank you so much, Annie. I really appreciate you uh, coming in and clarifying some of that for us. So, You're committee, uh, thanks for staying a little later than usual today. It's going to be that kind of a week, uh, so be prepared. <laughs> um, so, we'll pick this back up um, tomorrow after we uh, look at our uh, land and charter change in the morning. We'll be spending much of the rest of the day uh, on this. And so, thank you very much. Uh, I will communicate these notes to Tim and hopefully by mid morning tomorrow, some of the things we talked about today will be in an updated draft. Um, but for now, we will adjourn.